Ilong, it's so good to see you today. How are you doing, sir? Very well. Thank you. Oh, Thank you I'll... for having me. Oh, my goodness. I had so much fun with the Return to Metaphysics conversation. I yeah, enjoyed it so it much. And uh, I, I, I have to say, you're a man after my own heart. You do creative writing. You do philosophy. You do thinking. So it's just divine. And um, the other thing, I, I, I really, um, really appreciate uh, the work that you're doing on vector theories, you know, the, the concept of vector theory, the vectors. I, I, you know, on multiple occasions now, I've had conversations with Michelle where I brought up, we were talking about like literary, you know, like Hamlet. Mm. And what way is Hamlet real? And I found myself using oh, yeah. the language of vectors. And I, and I, and I really mm -hmm. like the language. I really like the concept. So I'm just really appreciate that you would be willing to talk about it, to explain it to people, because I think it's really on to something because it's, it's, it's an important angle that's so much fuller, so much more interesting than a lot of the different theories that you hear out of, uh, you know, out there to explain things. So, so if I would just say to you, you know, along, you know, what is a vector and, you know, what is vector theory all about? How would you answer that? Well, there's, there's a lot of different ways of answering it. Um, it it's a concept we borrow from mathematics. Mm. So a vector is something used in, in mathematics to describe uh, a magnitude of something that exists within a direction, a given direction. Mm. So basically a separation um, between different things and the separation between them are the vectors. So when we are talking about vector theory in relation to ontology, we are talking about what separates different modes of being. So let's say the way a literary character is real is different from the way this glass is real, for instance. So what we use vectors for, in a sense, is understanding what those differences are. And this ties into emergence theory as well, where we understand not only uh, how something exists, but also how it interrelates with other forms of existence. Mm. So we would we would not like we would not argue, or some would uh, argue, that that ideas exist uh, and primarily exist as mater materialistic objects. But we would find that it's very hard to measure and pinpoint a concept like Hamlet, for instance, because it needs to be experienced in order to exist. Mm. So in this case, we would say that. They are separated by a vector between, let's say, matter, which consists of atoms and stuff we understand as is like a material existence, and Hamlet, which is an idea and cannot really be said to exist um, or be made out of atoms in the same way. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the, the big picture uh, separation. Excellent, excellent. So vectors would be these different ontological levels. And I like kind of how you spoke about direction there. So if I were to say, what's the difference between a vector and a lot of people might think dimension, right? You know, alternative dimensions yeah. are different things. What would you say a difference between a vector and a dimension is? Well, I mean, even a dimension uh, has a lot of different definitions because True. within math, we, we are talking about like physical uh, dimensions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but within physics, we might conceive of the fourth dimensions of something different than a tesseract. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that when we're talking about dimensions, we are talking about something which exists. Um, let's imagine we have one line, then we have two lines, then we have three lines. And now, uh, now we have uh, uh, a three-dimensional object. Sure, sure, sure. But, they, but it fundamentally exists in the same way. Yes, got it. So the difference between a vector and a dimension is well, you can keep on adding dimensions to something, but in a physical space, more dimensions would still be a physical. The Excellent. question is then, if you take the, um, the physics space, and this depends on what dimensional theory you are applying, because like some would say that the fourth dimension is time. And then of course there is a vector based, like both time and space exist in physics, of course. Mm. But, but then we are dealing with, difference of quality uh, and not necessarily quantity, which, which is um, a dimensional uh, attribute. Well, I really like, one of the reasons I like the language of vectors so much is because it seems to be naming a concept that is really needed that's missing. So I think a lot of people, yeah. for example, when we were talking about Hamlet, they may say, oh, well, maybe it's like a different dimension. Well, the, like you say, it seems like um, ontologically dimensions can be all, all the same ontologically, right? But what you're talking about, it's like vector, you're talking about a different ontological 
uh, reality, if yeah. I use that. Like, and forgive me if I use some terms incorrectly. Different, um, you know, you got one dimension, you got a line, yeah, you got a sure. plane, you got a, you got a square, but all of that is physical. Yeah. It has the same ontology, but also yeah. it would be erroneous to say a line and a cube are equivalent, right? There are very real differences um, oh, yeah. on a dimensional level. But what's so lovely yeah. is you see, without the language of vector, I think a lot of people get kind of stuck thinking, all right, so maybe Hamlet is in a different yeah. dimension, but you're missing a yeah. term where, you know, this is crude, but, you know, if I'm thinking yeah. about someone like Kierkegaard, he talks about the difference between the horizontal and the vertical and like theology would yeah. be the vertical. So you say dimensions are horizontal, but people are using the word dimension to also almost refer to the vertical. But it seems like yeah. there's something different going on where if we're using that schema, dimensions yeah. are horizontal and, and vectors are vertical. Well, you know, if you don't if you don't have the language of vector, it's it's almost you're almost doomed to get confused because you're just going to be talking about different dimensions. And then you see, I think also it's very helpful because you were you were alluding to kind of the bigger picture where it's all you know it's all together, but you also have the phenomenological experience of the difference between yeah. dimensions and vectors. But then you can see how they all add up and come together in a bigger in a bigger schema as as we'll work toward. Yeah. So, so I, I, I would ask, like, if, if anybody is suggesting that Hamlet exists in a different dimension, I would ask them to, to qualify that statement mm. uh, because I'm not, I'm, I wouldn't be sure what they meant. I mean, ve vector for me is, is, is a really good concept because it all, there's also an operational aspect to it, which explains that, well, these, these are not entirely separated. They are combined because they exist on the same time axis. So, so another way of uh, explaining, let's say, the difference between uh, the phenomenological and the physical is through, let's say, Marcus Gaper's theory of uh, domains. Mm. But what happens with Marcus Gaper's theory of domains is that it excludes the existence of a single world. Mm. Therefore, his his uh, his famous book, uh, there is no there is no world. I can yeah. What what is it called? So, something to the extent that why, why the world doesn't exist is the title. So Marcus Gabriel's argument is that, well, these things are so radically different that there is no domain which can contain all the domains of existence. Because that's, that, is a, that is a non-statement. Mm. So I would say the difference between transcendental emergentism and let's say uh, Marcus Gabriel's domain theory is that, well, they both work, but there is a fundamental difference is do we believe that there is a single universe or not? Mm, mm, mm. So, and the, 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 like, and if we don't believe there's a single universe, then we can divide the world into like all these different domains and create like um, like shared domains or double contingencies uh, from Luhmann, for instance, mm. to, to learn how to communicate between them. But if we are trying to create, let's say, a non-theory of all, um, which is basically admitting that there is no theory of all, but by doing that, saying we, we need a way in order to communicate between, uh, let's say, materialistic science and psychology. Right. We need right. a way to do that because Marcus Gabriel would say, well, they don't even exist in the same universe. The, the materialist would reduce psychology to materialism. The idealist would reduce materia to like some part of the subconscious, right? That's, that's right. That's right. So in order to communicate with each other, I don't think the domain, the domain theory is like built on, let's say, a psychological need to keep the piece and carrot separate. Like, if you understand what I'm saying, like every, every, every ideology or every ontology to some extent is an expression of, let's say, a neurosis. Mm -hmm. so, so like all, all, all ontologies are because no ontology is true. All, all ontologies are separating themselves from the object to gain identity. And Absolutely. identity, as, as you know from cattle, is as much defined by difference as what you are lacking. Mm. So mm. like there is, to be a man, there is a neurosis of not being a woman built into us, built into what defines me as a man. Mm. And that's the same thing with materialism. Materialism is based on being extremely scared of difference. Mm -hmm. So we try to reduce everything to be a matter. It's mm -hmm. a, and you can see this in, in materialistic ideologies like Marxism. The, the most terrifying thing 
is there is a difference between rich and poor. So th there is a pathology here, but there's also a pathology in idealism mm. because idealism is petrified of losing uh, the self, the soul. So the whole universe has to be an expression of me. So, so all ontologies can be understood in this way to have some deeply neuro neurological level to them. But this is good because this creates identity. So what vector theory does, as opposed to Markus Schäfer, who says, well, like uh, th these things cannot interact at all. Vector theory says, okay, let's put them in a fucking line and let's find out how one evolves into the other and how they relate to each other without producing anything. So that's that's basically uh, no, that, that was the goal of absolutely it. excellent. I really appreciate that that run through. There's something about you know when there, you have this idea that there's no reality, or you say, oh, it's all just material. Both of those yeah. are an effort to escape the tension, right? You know, so you oh, know absolutely. we want you know we want um, we want Hamlet to just be a material yeah. phenomenon, you know, to not have any more complexity beyond that. Because if we do, well, then all we have to do is figure out how to explain materiality, and then we'll get a theory of everything or something like that. Mm. And you see, there's also something, I think you're putting it extremely well, that there is something about wanting these unified theories, because honestly, to say there's no reality is unified too. You're just unified in nothing. Mm. You know, there's a unity there. Yeah, yeah, just, um, yeah. You get out of the neurosis. You don't have the neurotic yeah. element anymore, because, because if you can set up a theory that's um, internally consistent, if you will, like it does all mm. within itself, you don't have to do anything. It just sits there mm. and takes care of itself. Exactly. But once you start saying that there are multiple planes, per se, multiple vectors, mm. well, a lot of the vectors like to kind of, there's something about human beings that like to bring the vectors together or the experience of the vectors or the ideas yes. of the different vectors in the human being. Crap, yes. crap. Yes. That means we are an active ingredient in the full mm. experience of reality. And that means we have an active role and that means we could mess up that means we have to do stuff. <laughs> Crap. I just want two plus two yeah. equal. I just want two plus two to equal four and I not have to worry about yeah. it. Because there's something about yeah. if all of reality ultimately is just, and obviously I'm not, I'm not bashing math. I'm, there's something about us that mm. wants reality to just be that. Because if it's mm. just something ontic per se, and that's it, mm. as opposed to the ontic being a vector that has to be explained in concert with the other vectors, well, then mm. there's no way for me to screw it up. All, all, yeah. the, all I have to do, frankly, is get subjectivity out of the way. I just have to get yeah. out of the way. And it's kind of funny because it's a way to defend our neurosis by seeing, seeming yeah. humble. It actually seems humble. Mm. It actually seems mm. like good and moral because it's like, well, I'm just, a, you know, my subjectivity, I'm just going to push the person mm. aside and get to the things themselves, quote unquote, the ontic. And yeah. what you're actually doing is absolving yourself of the dialectical tension, to use that phrase, between yeah. the different vectors and the resulting requirement of active thinking and confronting mm. the neurotic, you're hiding all of that in a sort of humility mm. um, and mm. then absolving yourself of having to deal with subjectivity because you just make it difficult, yeah. right? So there's something about us that wants that because one, well, one, it, it also doesn't move, really. It doesn't change. Like, once you start talking about vectors, you start getting into, like, oh, I don't know, Hegel, right? Well, you got these different vectors, mm -hmm. and maybe something could emerge between the vectors. Something new could happen. Mm -hmm. It's possible to have, you know, if, 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 if everything is just a single vector of materiality or idealism, mm -hmm. then all we got to do is find the internally consistent way to explain the vector of materialism, and then we're mm -hmm. done. Nothing will change. Yeah. We're, we're finished. Yeah. We can sit back and relax. It's literally possible to quote unquote rest, to reach a final point. But the moment you bring in vectors and multiple and having mm. to dialectically work between those, you basically just told me that I'm going to have to work mm. for the rest of my life. That I'm going to end. Yeah, exactly. And you also just told me that I, I, I can't just be like a specialist. I have to like do literature mm. and physics and science to understand <laughs> all the very, oh my gosh. I just want tenure along. What are you talking? Well, I just the want easy to thing. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. Well, the and easy thing course... is you find that they uh, they are all related, right? So, well, like when we're talking when we're talking about like the, the pathology of having like a, a, a single belief system, you're also in some sense talking about bad writing, right? Mm. Because like what a bad writer will do is avoid conflict yeah. or solve it way too quickly. And it's the same in like um, I know I know you are a musician as well. I, I am too. I also compose. Um, 
the same the same with badly of badly composed music it will resolve way too way too quickly and it will not really like explore anything hmm. so in some sense like all these things are following what I call principia, mm. which are like the the existence from identity of difference. Mm. So so let's say we solve that. Let's say we solve the puzzle. In some sense, like say we have a jigsaw puzzle, right? We solve it. In some sense, there were never never a jigsaw puzzle to begin with. You have to be able to see the cracks. You have to be able to see see what doesn't fit. And this also comes from Hegel and, and Science of Logic, mm. where he says, well, if A is A, A never emerges. It's, it's worse than a tautology. Yes. Like, it's, it's a self-contradiction. That's right. A can never be A, because for A to be something, it has to distinguish itself. So I think, like, we have to understand that um, difference and, and lack is, is just as necessary to existence as identity is. So abandon, abandon all hope of a solution uh, immediately. <laughs> oh, yeah. But well, that's, the only, that's, the, that's the only way to progress in anything, well, whether it be philosophy or art, anything. Well, if you, you know, I guess we, you, you, could all, you could bring in that language to the question of the many and the one, right? You know, if A is literally just A, seeing as mm. ultimately everything is a many, then once you make A equals A, it ceases being. It's not there and it's gone. But in the same way yeah. that once you make, but at the same way, the opposite mistake would be to simply say everything is a many. You know, that there's not, and I feel like once, I feel like that can almost be the mistake if we go back to the horizontal and the vertical language that I was using, you know, mm. where uh, dimensions are horizontal, vectors are vertical, and forgive me for the mm. imprecision of that language. There's a temptation to either say there's just the horizontal, you know, there's just dimensions mm. and they're all ontologically the same. Or you could likewise say there's ontological differences, but there's no way to connect them. Right. There's like different vectors, but they're all so separated mm. that there's no way to bring them together into a framework. And I think that's where you end up kind of saying there is no real. There's just divisions or there's just essential difference, maybe. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm going back and reading all of the news yeah. and I'm trying to figure out how I feel about the news yeah. uh, because there are parts of the news I love and difference of repetition. But then he goes after epistemologies of representation, like an an yeah. analogy and like representation. I feel like there's a problem there. But I always try, you know, I think it was harsher on Deleuze when I was younger because I really didn't like yeah. anti-edifice. But I'm trying to go back and kind of see the good. You know, I'm trying. Yeah. And I see, I really, do, I, I really do appreciate... Yeah the um, emphasis on quote unquote, what I'll call essential difference, like a centralizing yeah. difference, because then that actually kind of makes human ontology aesthetic. There's a beautiful, mm. like there's an artistic Absolutely. creative unfolding. That's quite lovely. Yes. But- yeah. I, I completely agree. Yeah, but the question becomes, what is the epistemology though, that can yeah. honor and observe essential di difference, but still make a coherence? Yeah. You know, how can you get yeah. a coherence? Because I feel like in Deleuze, there's kind of a notion that any, epistemological understanding that strives for coherence is a threat to essential difference. Well, of course it is. Yes. Yes. But that yeah. doesn't mean we can get away from playing with fire, right? Like if, if you, if you no. play with fire, you could burn and die, but also you need fire yeah. to eat, right? And to cook. So yeah. the problem is I, I feel like in Deleuze, and again, it's something that, and, and I see this in a lot of thinkers, there really mm. is, it's so difficult not to escape the tension in, in some different mm. form or another. And, mm. um, and that's what you just can't do. And and mm. I think also, but of course, once we start once we start taking this seriously, well, then you have to be an active thinker, and you do have to branch mm. out, and you do have to take different vectors. Because the other thing I was going to add, if in fact literature describes mm. a valid vector that human beings have to be part of and participate in, well, then mm. if you're going to do a good job living as a human being, then there are going mm. to be things you can learn from literature that you are going to be taking a big, you're going to be taking a big risk not to learn, correct? If yeah. you just, for example, focused on the sciences, but at the same time, if you study yeah. just literature, uh, you're going to have a very fragile understanding of reality because it's not going to be based in the physical world. Well, suddenly there is a kind of um, vector theory brings about, um, I guess, to allude to Clifford, a kind of epistemic mm. responsibility to investigate mm -hmm. all these different you're, it becomes um, epistemologically moral. It's like an ethical um, kind of drive to take yeah. the different vectors seriously. Well, uh, I mean, first of all, we, we, we might not necessarily we, we might not necessarily say that literature is a vector separated from consciousness, because sure. like what you what you have in literature is basically 
a physical medium uh, containing ideas which can only be interpreted through a, a conscious uh, individual, through experience. So basically we are taking chunks of experiences and designing something in the physical world to be able to transmit uh, that experience to another person. Mm. I was talking to Ebert about this because mm. like he had a, he has a concept about ideas compressing. Yes. And I was very adamant about saying uh, uh, ideas doesn't act like physical matter does. Sure. The way, the reason why we are thinking about ideas in terms of being able of compressing is because uh, this is also uh, like one of the loose points that a meme is pointing to a larger idea, but but the meme doesn't contain more information than like how many lines it is. Sure. It, ha it has to point to a reference. So it's not it's not compressed in the same way that let's say you can compress um, like water or something and it mm. becomes denser. Mm. Um, mm. That's, a, that's a physical compression. Uh, but the reason why we think about ideas in, in physical terms is because we are so out the way we communicate, like when I'm communicating with you now, I'm, I'm using air and I'm using the sound. That's a physical transaction. I like I'm, I'm communicating my ideas, which doesn't exist in physical space at all through a physical medium. So like the longer it takes for me to explain something, the larger we would think the idea are but the idea appears to me as, as a fully constructed thing. So like when you say something, like if it's entirely new to me, I have to take some time, right. to process your information. But whenever it's processed, I can call upon that knowledge immediately. Mm. It's not like a larger idea. It's harder for me to, to uh, call to my memory than a simple idea. It's mm. just there because size, like we, we are using it as a language of association, but there, there is no size in ideas. That, no, this, is, that is something we use because we exist right, in this, the physical space as well. This, this is outstanding because like my, my favorite um, act to examine that I think is very ontologically rich and is basically the foundation for reconstructing ASA is the act of reading a book or the act of playing yeah. sheet music. Because reading a book is so very strange. And to your point before I move on, yeah, when I say the word cat to you, you don't hear C A T. You just see, you know, the neighbor's um, the yeah. neighbor's feline that likes to sleep on your outdoor couch that you have to clean after yeah. every every noon, right? It doesn't present itself piecemeal. Mm. It presents itself sort of holistic, like as a as a whole. And then of course the question would be, you know, as a whole, you know, it's interesting in the compression compact because it is the whole itself an expanding of the individual idea of cat into the whole scene, or is the whole scene itself an individual idea that then you could move as a movie. Say you then envision well, the cat jumping down you from can, the cat. You can make a, the concept cat. You can make infinitely complex. Yes. So so there is no there is no lack of complexity to a, to a single concept combined with let's say all the animals in existence. Right. That's right. That's so right. So it's not like cat is less complex than all animals in existence. That, they're that, both um, they're both like equal. They're both infinities. In oh fact, sure. You know a hill. Hil it's like Hilbert's Hotel. Do you know Hilbert's Hotel? Hilbert Hotel. I do not. I do not, Mister Alone. Oh, like, like we come, like uh, it's late at night. We, 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 we need a place to stay. We know there's a hotel with infinite rooms on the other side of the street from the bar we're drinking in. We go in. There is an infinite amount of people there already staying there. We ask in the reception. Well, what if everybody moved two rooms up? Then there would be room for us. So in infinite plus two is still infinite. Right. And then right. you repeat the story with no. Now I bring infinite friends, right? But then we go to equal and unequal numbers. So mm. infinite plus infinite is still infinite, and that's right. the same for let's say cat versus the entirety of uh, biological existence. Oh sure, 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 sure. So so ideas ideas doesn't operate in size, but if we were writing books, then or if I'm communicating. Then it's true that a book about cats has more information than me just saying the word cat, but that's because I'm using a physics-based medium like mm. sound or text to transmit to you. Mm. Mm. So we have to, uh, and this is why um, Marcus Gabriel is wrong because they do interact, these domains. Wow. Right, right. And, that, and that's I'm, where I'm the act of reading. With you. 
Oh yeah, and that's where the act of reading, I think, is so critical because, uh, and and I'll get at because when you read a book, you're there reading black marks on paper, but you're actually also you're here reading the marks on yeah. paper, but you're also there in the story. Yeah. You have this here slash yeah. there dynamic that's an operation that you cannot reduce the story of say watching Frodo go to the Shire in your head to the words on the paper, but also. Frodo going to the Shire in your head would not be possible without the words mm. on the paper. So there's this interaction yeah. that's going on. And that's why I like also yeah. when you're talking about, you know, I, I talk about, you know, I was saying separate, but there's an interconnection between the different vectors mm. where they kind of go, they, yeah. they, they, they enter, they interrelate, but they can't, but yeah. they don't necessarily, you can't reduce one to the other. You can't no. say that it therefore they, equals. And the difference between vectors is that they act in completely different ways. Right. So let's say, um, the more complex uh, you like, the more complex an idea becomes in your frame of reference. Actually, the simpler it becomes. So, take sheet music for instance. Like the first time you look at, uh, let's say, Franklis, it looks insanely complex, and it still is for most yeah. mortals. <laughs> Any Bach, you just kind of go, oh, okay. But yeah, Bach, and, <laughs> like, like all what? those motherfuckers. It's like <laughs> I'm, I'm just like, but. The more you, the more you understand it, the larger your complexity grows up, up to re represent that. The actually the simpler it becomes, and then it becomes like it, it becomes at some point it becomes like just as simple as breathing. Sure. But when you look at, and it's the same with, like, but other systems if we take we took like a purely physical system, like complexity wouldn't necessarily make something simpler in the same in the same way. No, it, it almost seems like you have, um, you know, when you're talking about that, like there's almost kind of relativity, relativity issue. I mean, for example, so for example, if I take my uh, one year old, my two year old, and I show him a cat, yeah. you were talking about how the, the concept of cat is infinitely complex. Yeah. Well, when he looks at the cat, all he's ever known is um, Oreo, because it's a very good name for a black and white cat that comes from a barn. So you say this is Oreo. And his only reference to cats is Oreo, because it's the only cat that he has ever seen. So even though mm. the cat entails a potential complexity, infinite complexity from his frame mm. of reference it's at, he's going mm. to actually have to expand it his it's almost like as yeah. his ID, so he'll what will happen he'll probably go down to the barn and see the orange cat that lives in the barn and mm. then boom oh it turns out that cats can be orange and so then you mm. start to say oh okay so cats not all cats equal oreo oh some cats are also yeah. orange so the concept starts to expand his idea because so he had an experience yeah. that showed the experience could expand now his idea is expanding and as it expands yeah. you know you kind of have that sort of motion where I'm thinking of kind of the Ebert kind of thing. So there's kind of like, any, yeah. I think, I think also what's interesting there, and this is where I also really like vector theory, is if we're thinking like Aristotle's distinctions between the essential dimension of the cat and the accidental dimension mm. of the cat, that's when that yeah. gets introduced. Because you say, okay, well, I guess white and orange is not essential to a cat. It's accidental to a mm. cat. So now the difference the very experience mm. of the difference then even brings the concept of there must be a distinction between the accidental and the essential. And how do we locate yeah. the essential? And another reason, yeah. and, it's a, and it's kind of an add-on, I'll get back to the ontology of reading, mm. is if you don't have vector theory, then you can't do that kind of search for the essential in your overall mm. work, you know, your overall ontological yeah. framework. There is no difference between mm. the accidental and the essential. There's just the one, yeah. the essential and the accidental equals the material. It's all the same. Mm. And so in the same way that once you have experiences of different color cats, that even creates the possibility of the distinction between the accidental and, um, and essential following Aristotle. Absolute, yeah. So that yeah. occurs with the entire freaking universe, you know, the entire existence. Yeah. Once you get separations of vectors, because there's now things that are accidental to a vector um, versus oh, essential so to the vector. Small neck. Oh, and, and those different, yeah, oh, the yeah, lack. yeah, you get into the different lacks. So the, the separation of the vectors opens an entire new realm of inquiry in the same way that even, you know, I was, I was slightly bashing specialists earlier, but I want to make very clear mm -hmm. that we need a world of people who are specialized in things. The problem becomes pinja holing. You know, I, I like what Dietrich McClowski says. He always says, you know, be a specialist, but read widely. I always think that's kind of yeah. neat because you have to have a job, right? You know, you know, I can't, uh, sure. I, you know, uh, as far as I know, I mean, if I, I haven't convinced uh, <laughs> my kids to go to work for <laughs> uh, I might. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but he talks about that because what ends up happening is very interesting. When you do this mm. whole like reading widely, you then can tell, mm. you can see those differences that like are a sense, yeah. you know, you see these overlaying patterns between, say, literature and science and the things that overlay. Mm. Uh, and I actually do like Deleuze's language of overlay, if I recall mm. that. I think that's kind of nice. And uh, when you yeah. start to say, well, wait a minute, this 
part of the human experience shows up in literature and it shows up in science and it shows up in my daily life. Well, maybe there's something essential to that as opposed yeah. to really accidental. Now, of course, I understand the danger of the word essential is you get into essentialism and that can get us to Foucault yeah. and, and all that different stuff. But if there is no connecting elements, uh, if there's no if there's no, well, there can't be interaction. You know, you were speaking about vectors having the possibility of interacting. Well, if they can't hmm. have some essence using Aristotle's language, then interaction becomes po impossible. And that actually is yeah. alluding, that, that's actually alluding to what I think might be a valid critique of Deleuze, is that you don't yeah. have enough ability to relate the essential differences uh, because of your epistemological models. But I have to think yeah. about that because I think I think Deleuze may say that he hates the dialectic and proceed to use it, um, which is always mm. kind of funny. It's almost like a, a you yeah. know, it's like a Harold Bloom talking about uh, the anxiety of influence where you're influenced, but then you're like, I hate that guy. So people don't mm. find out your influence. There might actually be that going on in Deleuze. But again, I keep alluding yeah. to papers I haven't finished and I forgive me for that. But the, well, uh, nobody has. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and so likewise, you know, the separation of the vectors makes possible all that lines of inquiry. But what I was going to say, what's so interesting is that in the act of reading and in the yeah. conversation um, with Cadell on absolute knowing, I, I actually think mm. this ties to Hegel's absolute knowing, there's this simultaneous yeah. here and there going on mm. that's very, very strange. In the same way yeah. that when I, if you play a piece of music off the sheet music, the sheet music mm. is in fact in the symphony orchestra, and yet it isn't yeah. at all. Like if um, yeah, if I handed you the sheet music and says, well, you know, if you if I ask you, hey, you ever heard of Beethoven's Ninth? And you're like, no. Mm. Oh well, here. And I hand you the sheet music. Yeah. And I'm like, well, now you know about it. You'd be, yeah, you'd be kind sure. of crazy. Like, no, you don't know about it until you hear it. Dang it. No. Uh, so yeah. so so there's this double action going on. What I think is interesting. Mm is that there's almost this mixing of vectors. If I'm using that language and I might not be doing it correctly, but I think it's this interaction that you're describing. When I read a mm. book, I am simultaneously in the vector of the ideas in that sort yeah. of story, thinking it through. That's only possible though, because of material reality, but it also could not yes. be reduced to material reality. And if, and if mm. I were to like ask, like if I go up to a scientist or something, and I were to ask him to explain, it's like, so what's this like movie going on in my head when I read a book, what mm. is that? And he were to say, oh, well, it's marks, marks on a page. It would be so yeah. reductionist. It would be so oh, yeah. strange. And, and I think that what you're getting at is that these vectors, they, you, they operate differently. You cannot put them down there. But if we don't mm. have the language of vectors, well, then, you know, yeah, it just marks on a page, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the, one, of, one of the big problems we are facing right now, because like what, what you were talking about, a lot of really, really interesting subjects. But like one of the things you were mentioning was like, the difference between like a, spe a, a specialist. Mm. So like, I believe that like for, for very good nomatological reasons, uh, human beings are specialists. Sure. So like, um, like I, I'm a creative person, uh, but if everybody was creative, uh, like society would break down immediately. Yeah. Sure, sure. Because if, if you, let's say we have like 20 hunters going on a hunt, uh, and one of the like one of the hunters think it's a really neat idea to take like a gut from the animal and start playing music with the bow on it. That's amazing. If one person is doing it, it's terrible. If all the hunters are doing it, it wouldn't work too well, would it? <laughs> no, it would. It would like it would starve to death immediately. <laughs> but but on the other hand, like if if that one uh, hunter who does that doesn't exist, then there are no stories. Then, then there are no like. Um, then we have no, nothing to tell ourselves in the night in order to stay together and, and go out and hunt. Mm. So when we're talking about Deleuze, he is an artist. He is not um, like Hegel, Hegel is a scientist. So basically you, you are taking an, an artist and trying to interpret a, 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 a scientist. And, and that creates an enormously rich uh, and important difference. But when I was younger, I fucking hated Deleuze. I hated Lacan because I thought they were being deliberately obscure, mm -hmm. and I was looking, I was looking for answers, mm. um, and I didn't necessarily understand that. Well, the journey itself is is part of the answer. Like being confused, accepting confusion, is is part of the answer. So you're like when you're talking about like you, you were earlier mentioning Lacan's the real. Like what the like nobody knows what that is. 
like not even the cans knows what that is. And like in some sense, we are imagining like this pathic, unintelligible realm, but um, which which exists and somehow doesn't exist. And but but it's it's uh, something that even in the effort of trying to understand that it leads us to new discoveries. So we have the specialists and and scientists are specialists, artists are specialists, um, like politicians are specialists. All these like a hundred and like 56 uh, different people of the Dunbar tribe, right? Sure. Like yeah. the 156 people that make up humanity, right? right? right. Um, but you also need an axialist. Mm. And, this, and, uh, and this, is a, I, this is from like a really old uh, sci-fi story. It was a story about um, a ship going into the stars and there are all these scientists aboard it. But th th there's only one person called the axialist who is able to absorb all the information and makes the, and make them communicate together? Hmm. Um, it's a great it's a great sci-fi story, wow. but but I think there's also so the the, the mistake a lot of nexialists make is trying to become messianic. Yes. So and this is what we call like the pillar saints and the boy pharaohs, like the people who are trying in some to fit all of reality within a single understanding. Yeah. Like the way to cross communicate between these specialists is to create double, as this is from Niklas Luhmann, double contingencies. So accepting that each exists on their own right. And when we make them communicate, like then we are talking about, let's say, um, we can talk about like the, the biology of mental constructs, but we have to understand that mental construct cannot be reduced to biology. And we can also talk about the mental constructs of biology, like with, and you're seeing that a lot right now where people are arguing like um, a lot of like intersectionalists and, and also based on Foucault, like arguing that biology is, is basically like just a, an idea which began to exist in a society and can itself be like a tool of oppression and like all these things. But then you are, but when you're saying that you are also reducing biology to in the interpersonal order, which is social constructivism, right? Oh, so, oh yeah. So, well, if, 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 so, if we... I'm so like social you. constructionism, that's okay. But like when we, we have biology, then we have consciousness, and then we have interpersonal interactions. Right. Interpersonal right. interactions are called is culture. Uh, uh, consciousness is like experience, and biology is, is um, let's say, metabolism, right? So the meta theory is understanding what separates these things and, and how the fuck do they interact. Right. And a lot of the problems we are seeing right now is that the constru uh, social constructivists, the intersectionalists, the critical theorists are trying to reduce everything to being interpersonal. Right. Yeah. Right. And then you have like the idealists who are trying to say, well, everything is just consciousness. And the materialists will say, well, fuck those other two, there's only matter, right? So we need we need that vector theory to be able to cross communicate between well, them. Well, if you take you know a few things. So one, if we take that old Hegel idea that A equals B that Dr. Last talks about, everything is so much harder. You know, we want uh, yeah. if if we could just say that everything was intersection. Well, there's still a unity yeah. there. We just have to focus on the intersection. If we could say everything was a, was being, you know, just a singular being of a singular ontology. Again, it goes back to what we said before. The key, you know, I just keep thinking of that phrase, you know, the problem of the one and the many, right? Well, you almost could say A equals B, you could say one equals many, kind of using a Hegelian mm -hmm. sort of phrase, right? But the trick, um, as I understand vector theory, is you're locate. So traditionally, we tend to locate the oneness of that many in a vector, where really the oneness is a result of the interaction between the vectors. Like the, any sort of oneness that you can find or any sort of like, the, the fact that you can refer to a kind of oneness is a result of the interaction of the vectors, but each vector, which then has a temptation to just kind of disown the other vectors as being the only one, each one of those then has an experience of being all there is, but the, but yeah. the kind of idea that, that the interrelationship, I guess what I'm trying to say is locate any, because the difference between I understand vector theory and other things is that you're not, you're not saying that many equals many, right? You're saying that there's like vectors, but they all interrelate and they all work together. Well, there's a kind of unit. I don't, I don't like using it. Oh, let's use this word. Let's say there's a harmony. 
almost a harmony between the vectors is what they're seeking to do. They're different. Like you have the, um, you have the flute, you have the violin, you have the piano. Each, those instruments don't equal one another. You can't say no. that the piano, you can say they're all instruments, but that's so vague, it doesn't really tell you anything. Uh, you can say they're all vectors, but okay, great. But, but the instruments then, the name of the game is to figure out how the instruments can play in the right order at the right time at the right pitch so it creates the symphony orchestra right so vector so the one i guess what i'm trying to say is the oneness of vector theory is the the song is the symphony orchestra that emerges from the interrelation of the different vectors. But today, since we don't even think about this possibility because we don't have vector theory, we're not making music. What we're trying to do is the pianists are saying, you trumpet people suck, you don't do anything important. The trumpet well, people, they're like disowning and trying to create hierarchies. Okay. Well, I, I, okay, fair enough, I understand your point. I would say that that vector theory is, is first and foremost a pragmatic tool. Mm. So I'm like, when I'm talking about vectors, I, I concede immediately that it's a, a, a conceptual tool I use to make sense of difference sure. between. Sure. So I'm not claiming at all that there is an ontic difference between consciousness and biology or mm. matter and biology. Mm. So, so then you can go into like monism and, and all these things. Sure. I think, I think the, the problem with going into monism is that you're making one is one. Like right. you're saying, everything is one. So I would say that from a pragmatic perspective, accepting difference is the only way to avoid the death of identity. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, but it's not necessarily a description of how the real uh, or the ontic actually is. Sure, sure. And I think you could get here, um, and maybe if I'm looking for language. Because like, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's a difference between like my mind and the table. Do you well, like, because like you can always like you can always do um, like you can always go to solipsism if you want to, right? Oh sure, so, like, oh, sure. There's nothing. There's nothing stopping you from like Marcus Gabriel says. Well, there's no arguments against solipsism, except that I won't be, speak to you anymore. Oh yeah, right? well, That's Marcus Gabriel's argument. You know, one I get. You know, so um, like you can always go to solipsism. You know, there there is yeah. very good reason to think that the ontic is ultimately one. That everything ontically has some sort of oneness, possibly to it. I don't know, um, but ontologically, well, there I are guess. also there are also really good reasons to think why it's not. Because hmm. like if, if everything if everything is wrong, one like the, no identity can emerge. Sure. So they sure. can be like because like then well, how would you even have fluctuation between energy states? If like the lack right, of energy right, was also right. a form of energy, right? Right. But right. then again, like both both answers make sense. But this is like the and what I call um, like double aspect monism mm. is that, that there isn't necessarily a, a single explanation for reality because right. like what what ex, what an explanation is is a is a sense making like operation. Right. We like 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 just like your 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 child is making sense of the Oreo and the cat and right. like making an association. We, we are doing the same thing with our limited mental capacities and our, and our, mental, and our, our limited, like say physical uh, capacities for sensing what's going on around us, right? Oh yeah. So oh, like yeah. If, you ask, if you ask me and a, and a mantis shrimp like about the world, like you would have radically different answers. And one, like one of the things Wittgenstein says is that well, the reason why you don't understand what a lion is saying is because you, you aren't a fucking lion. Yes, you aren't a lion. So you have to live, you have to live in the lion's world in order to understand what the lion is saying. And, oh, yeah. and like, uh, just just a quick reference, taking into fiction again. That's what I really love about the movie Arrival. Mm. Yeah, because, I love like, Arrival. The, the yeah. main point of that movie is that human experience and the experience of the alien are so vastly different that the only way for them to communicate is for humans to experience time differently. Oh yeah. So that is like the Wittgenstein, uh, Wittgenstein's idea of like, well, in order to speak line, you have to be a line. Oh and yeah. It's the same for our sense making machines. So like, fuck the ontic, because like the ontic would be would be and and another way we had this uh, conversation earlier, like the perfect map, right? Yes. Like the only way to describe reality would create an explanation that was larger than reality itself because it had to include the explanation. Oh, sure. Oh, so sure. Absolutely. Otherwise, 
it's as it's a it's a pragmatic representation. We we like that's all it is. Oh, but that's but why I really still. that's one of the reasons I really like the vector theory is because if I'm using this language between the quote unquote ontic and the ontological, you know, the vector theory yeah. helps me in the ontological. And you know, usually when I speak, I'm you know, and I and I should clarify, usually I'm speaking from the standpoint of my phenomenological experience and the individual. You know, yeah. when you start yeah. moving back to the beginning of the universe, yeah, right, exactly. Maybe it's pure ontic, maybe it's ontic slash ontological somehow, maybe it's pure ontological. I don't know. It's yeah. really interesting, it's hard to say. Um, and so certainly. Ultimately, um, the the material, uh, maybe even the experience of Hamlet, the story of Hamlet in my head, is ultimately somehow material. Certainly, I don't know. You'd have to go all the way back. But from my phenomenological experience, the story of Hamlet material. How, how would Hamlet be material? Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, it, I was just making the point that in my phenomenological experience. There is a separation between the story of Hamlet that I am experiencing that seems distinct from the book Hamlet that I am reading. Oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. and 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 sense. and so what's really interesting is yeah. I like vector theory so much because there is it, it that act is what I feel like philosophers don't explain that mystery yeah. of reading yeah. and having these double. Um, and I'm just going to say ontology or these double realities or whatever going on. You're reading a book, but you're also yeah. in the story. And I think yeah. this is really important because you can't reduce the one to the other. And I think what it yeah. shows is something I talk about, you know, with Michelle a lot is the idea that yeah. um, we're actually very often, the majority of our lives are actually toward um, things that cannot be reduced to materiality. And, and let me explain what I mean sure. by that. Um, yeah. so, so if I think of the idea of Hamlet, you know, yeah. you know, or let me, maybe a unicorn, uh, you know, it's a pure yeah. idea, right? Relative to me, it's a pure idea. And then let's say um, I go, so it would be an animate object, right? It's just purely animate yeah. in my head. Or or maybe let's put it this way. I, as a human being, is an animate object, okay? And then I yeah. go to the, well, the, you know, and I go to the ocean and there's a rock. And I would say, oh, mm -hmm. that's an inanimate object, right? Because it's not yeah. animated, it's a rock. But then I come to my laptop. The, my language is it's an inanimate object as well, but it actually seems different than a rock because the laptop yeah. would not exist if the animated human being wasn't around to bring into existence yeah. the laptop, right? Yeah. So, so, but the problem is I experience my laptop as if it is equi mm -hmm. equivalent in its ontology to the rock. Would really, I like to say you have animate objects, you have inanimate objects, and then you have um, inanimate objects with the parentheses around the inanimate, which would be the laptop. Yeah. You know, because the laptop yeah. is, a is an inanimate object, though, that came as a result of animated human beings and wouldn't have come about, yeah. uh, you know, like yeah. a rock, right? So here's yeah. the funny thing, though. I necessarily experience my laptop as just material. Yeah. I don't experience yeah. the ideas or the consciousness that okay. came up with the idea of the laptop. And that that makes about. a lot of sense. And yeah. so what ends up happening is in my, I am constantly having like the majority of my, if not basically every experience is of mm. materiality, which then makes it very, mm. very easy to think that everything okay. is materiality. Well, let me, let, let me ask you a question then. That's, yes. That like, because what, okay, so I would say there's a difference between what, what you're engaging with at what point of time, like at what time. Sure. So, like when, like when we look at the world around us, but if you live, uh, like, unless you live in a total desolate, like, um, area where there's been no humans for for millennia, right? Sure. Like everything you're looking at is is ideas. Sure. Like literally, in like I. Yeah, exactly. I look around in my room, it's a, it's almost impossible for me to find something which isn't an idea. Exactly. But what we also have to understand is how am I engaging with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I am in like so you say, well, you look at a machine and you don't see the idea. I disagree. I think yeah. everything you see is the idea. I don't think you ever see the object. Mm. Because like let's say we are baking baking a bread, piece of bread, right? When 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 do you engage with the material world in that process? Well, maybe when you're measuring the flower, because like you're abstract, you're ab abstracting your experience of like interacting with the world into like a number which has nothing to do specifically with your experience right so i would say and this is also like he Hegel has the concept transcendental materialism yes yes which came before which came before uh, me and past transcendental uh, transcendental emergentism mm -hmm. 
But what Hegel's transcendental materialism was, is that, well, we can pretty much surmise that there is a material world, mm. but that is not the world we are engaging with. Right. So like, uh, this also comes from Bergson, Bergson, um, like when, when, like where, where is the image? Like when you're looking at the world around you, like you're seeing a material object, where is the image? Mm. I mean, it's not in your brain, right? Because like how, like um, if you ask, like, at, like if you, at, like if you ask a, like neuroscientists, this they will like leave the room or or avoid avoid answering it. But like, how is the like the part of your brain which is like um, apparently like uh, allegedly processing images? And the part of your brain that is allegedly processing uh, sound communicating together when they're located at different parts of the brain and simultaneously creating like this film we, we find ourselves in, which is immediate to the senses. So, I mean, there's, there's no explanation for that. So like, um, it's, it's the same thing, like you can have like all the images in your computer which are all materialistic things, but they only exist when you look at them, yes. right? Yes. Otherwise, there is no, there is no meme, there is no picture of a free-headed dog. Like well, all those well, things don't exist. At, you know what's so critical that you're getting at is that if you actually pay real close attention to how you experience the world, like actually the yes. experience itself, it shows you that hard materialism is quite silly. Um, you know, once, yeah. if you really yeah. just pay attention and you, because here's what people, you know, I make a distinction between what I call thinking and perceiving. So for example, yeah. when I, um, you know, when I look at this laptop, I tend to think, oh, it's a laptop. But, but also I can look at this laptop and like turn off my brain, almost a meditative state yeah. where I just perceive it. No, thoughtlessly yeah. perceive it, okay? Well, the, well, so quickly the thinking rushes in when I stop thinking that it just consumes it as if, as if all I did was um, think the whole time, right? Like mm. that there's no other mental act. But here's the weird thing. We actually then, the, you can turn off your brain and it's so like just raw perceive and it's so mm. weird. Like when you really yeah. try to meditate, for example, mm. that act yeah. unveils to you that you're actually mostly dealing with ideas <laughs> because it's so, oh, and, and actually what ends up happening is we start saying that thinking equals perceiving. That if I am mm. thinking about the, the laptop, then that is the same as thoughtlessly taking in the laptop. And therefore mm. the idea is the material, but in the negative sense, it's just yeah. the material. And so then yeah. we think the, here's the problem, you know, there's this great um, book um, I did, I did like call it a, um, Homo Hiragoctesis by Louis Demond. And he was, he was doing a lot yeah. of work on the, uh, the, um, the caste system in India and different things. And basically he ends the sure. book saying the only way you can explain the caste system is that there's something about human beings that is inherently hierarchical. We want hierarchy. Yeah. We love to create hierarchy. Yeah. And what's key though, is he says, you know, the problem is we, we don't just make order we tend to also bring in power. And so how can we stop mm. that, right? How can we just do hierarchy? Mm. There's something similar that goes on. It's like, we mm. want um, we want to create a, we don't want vectors. We want hierarchies, mm. you know, in reality, mm. where, where one is so much more real than all the other mm. things. It's as if the other mm. things aren't real at all. Um, there's actually, it's funny, there's a, there's a great theologian who talks about the Torah Oh gosh, what is yeah. it? And I forget the term, but he makes the point that in the Old Testament, there's actually many gods. There's not just one. There's like a, there's sure, a bunch of different absolutely. gods. But the funny yeah, thing, Elohim. but but the funny thing is that the, the y y y Yahweh is so much more God than the other gods. It's as yeah. if they're not even gods. You know, it's polytheism, mm -hmm. but it's like so he's so much more God than the other gods that they're, they're almost yeah. not even like deities anymore. In a similar way, yeah. we like to create ontological hierarchies where one yeah. ontological realm like materiality is so much more real than the mental, so mm. much more real than all the other ones that it's as if the other ones don't even exist. And that's what we yeah. tend to do. And then that confuses us. And then what ends up happening yeah. is the human condition ends up just being explained in terms of materiality. But if the mm. subjective element of the human matters, then, mm. then what ends up happening is we explain the person away. And I was talking with Cadell yeah. about this is that I, you know, I talk about the difference between explain and address. And so, for yeah. example, we're so bent on explaining, you know, we end up explaining people in, ter in terms of materiality that we don't mm. address their subjective experience and their person. So, oh, we, ex so yeah. we explain them away. We end up explaining mm. them away. And you mm. see, what's so funny is I get to your point, like, 
look around you. There's everything is ideas. <laughs> like everything yeah. around you is a result of ideas. And you hardly yeah. go through a moment in the day where your subject yeah. is not screaming at you or saying something yeah. or interpreting what's going on. And, but, yeah. by, but you see, if you accept that difference that you're describing, well, then you mm. have to get dialectical. Then you have to be an yeah. active thinker. You have to figure out Absolutely. how they interact and how they go together. Yeah. And that becomes much more difficult. And yeah. to kind of, I think, allude to what you're also, you know, the, the other part of this, that also, if there are different um, ontologies that are interacting, yeah. then, then new things can emerge. And that means we don't yeah. have as much control. And if we don't have control, yeah. that's scary. Uh, you know, well, it's scary. So, so when we are looking at the problems with, with seeing the whole world, uh, as being materialistic, and and this this might sound like uh, a far fetch, but I would say one of the problems that come in is is uh, public school, <laughs> sure. and I will I will I will, like, I will explain why. But because like if you are taking the idea that well we are we are all just matter, then the difference between human beings are raised away. Yes. So we would we would say that well then we can just take thirty kids. And if we put them through the same things, then then they will like like uh, if there's something wrong with them, they won't succeed. But they will all have the same chances of succeeding without like any taking any like um, interest in in the possible differences okay. that are phenomenologically speaking. That's right. The other point is that like you can't that, like when there isn't like when you're experiencing matter, you can't separate matter from the experience. Right. Like, like you have to, you have to say that you are. There's no like you. You can we can abstract, ab abstract and say, well, if I wasn't looking at it, it would still exist. Mm. So that's the best. That's pretty much the best we can do. But right. we have to understand that matter always necessarily, for us at least, exists within a conceptual frame. Okay. Because like like matter without a conceptual frame is tautologically meaningless. Right. So for matter to have any meaning, like it needs the conceptual frame of consciousness, which cannot be matter itself. Because <laughs> like, yeah. So, I mean, so that's the big problem. But like, I mean, and, and the way it happened, historically speaking, was that like Hegel's dialectical materialism led to Marx and Engels' historical materialism and, 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 uh, and dialectic materialism which pretty much, and like at this point, it was a pretty fucking revolutionary idea sure. that we could understand everything through matter. And it was not like, like they were all, their problem was they were too scientific. Right. And then like the whole idea of value and like subjective create, like subjective evaluation went out of the window. And then we ended up like adopting like the Prussian, um, like a military system and decided that it was a great fucking idea to send uh, like generations of kids through that. And what happened immediately after that? First World War, one generation after, 30 years after the, pop, the school system was introduced in Europe, First World War, and then Second World War right after it. And like my understanding is that it comes from a pathology of materialism, mm -hmm. like the, the anxiety of difference. And like you're, as you're saying, like, well, most people don't go into the dialectic. They, they mostly adopt whatever, like the, um, like the zeitgeist is. So let's say like before, before Freud and Jung, like the idea of the subconscious was like super fucking alien. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it's like main, like main, accepted by everyone. Right. So right. like there are these like outlier thinkers, which like pushes, humanity in one direction or another and it has enormous consequences huge, huge, like, huge. um so it's it, i think it's time now to go go away like and of course like before materialism we had like um two thousand years of idealism right. yeah yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Where, where every where everything like and and like um and and, then we, uh, and it's not because there are not useful things in idealism and it's not because there are not useful things in materialism but we have to understand that both of those systems came with pathologies yes. which like led to like like uh, like uh, like hum ethic ca ca catastrophes 
No, th this is outstanding so, uh, because, you know, if I use the language of address and explain. So, for example, with idolism, you can as associate with address materialism with yeah. explain. So we went through years and years and years of, uh, of pure address, as I'll call it, more religion, yeah. which is addressing you. You know, the book of Genesis addresses you, even if it doesn't explain how things came into existence. And then we went into pure explanation, uh, you know, where it's yeah. just materialism. And now you're saying you need a dialectic between explain yeah. and address. Um, and yeah. for whatever reason, we just, the human brain, well, we talked about it with the return to metaphysics. The brain hates freaking dialectics. It wants something, a stable state. <laughs> It wants one or the other. It doesn't want both. I, and, you know, I think it's quite funny because the brain seeks to kind of like rest. I guess maybe it's ever we want yeah. to like save energy. And like when you're talking about dialectic, it's work and we just want to stop. A helpful concept for this. And then I want to talk about Marx is that, you know, yeah. in, the, in the book of Genesis, when it talks about God resting on the seventh day, it's really critical. The word rest is more like God sitting on a throne to rule. It does not mean nap. And also, mm. there's actually work in the Garden of Eden. There's not toil, yeah. but there's work. They got to name sure. the animals yeah. and take care of things. We got this concept mm. of like, uh, we've unfortunately, especially in the West, because I think Christianity is the predominant, at least in America, you know, we've got this idea that paradise is where you don't work. No, no, no. Paradise mm. is where you don't have toil. You have meaningful work yeah. and you reside over. It's like, you know, mm. there's a kind of residing, but there's, and there's difference in the Garden of Eden. There's animals, yeah. there's humans, and actually, Adam is supposed to take care of the animals. You're not actually mm supposed to eat meat it's not till noah that you mm. get the eating of meat. you know different so there's mm. a hierarchy it's just very different from the concept the other yeah. thing i want to do so we need a dialectic between pure and address and obviously the you get into the crisis and psychology you know they, they, greg talks about dr hinkley and different things it's quite yeah. important what's so in, what's so telling of marx um so you got uh you know the material dialectic being formulated by mm. the bourgeoisie the people who own the means of production and the people who the yeah. proletariat who um run the means of production who work the means of production and so there's an alienation because and then that eventually leads to class struggle and so on and so forth who's missing there's a third class actually that's missing i like to call them the artifacts it's called the people who create the means of destruction i mean the means of creating yeah. well, maybe destruction the means of production <laughs> there's no creativity in marx where's the creative class? Yeah. he puts the no, artist exactly. in the you know he puts the artist in the kind of proletariat, he kind of suggests mm. the creators are in the proletariat. Mm. Uh, no, yeah. if you're going to tell yeah. me that the classes are totally defined by their relation to the means mm. of production, then you should have a third class called the art mm. that I want to call from Latin the artifact, which is the creator mm. of the means of production. But wait a minute. Yeah. Once you start talking about creativity, you're talking about mental processes yeah. and you start introducing the mystery of how the mm. brain works and how it creates and yeah no man marx marx got his hegel from the philosophy of right basically we don't you know we're yeah. going to kind of build up on that and once you start emphasizing the creative act and that's like some of the russian theologians like Bol Boljaev mm. and different ones they really yeah. are, they really emphasize the meaning of the creative act and you see and i think Dietrich mcclowski is correct oh and here's the key if there's an artifact that can create the means of production well, the determinism hmm. that Marx talks about, the inevitability of the class struggle is not inevitable because anyone in yeah. the proletariat at any times can create a new means of production, but therefore hmm. own that means of production and escape the proletariat, thus relieving yeah. the tension between the, the two classes. So that starts to well, explain, yeah. you know, why, you know, and I, you know, that also depends on um, how much creativity it becomes radically contingent because if you have a non-creative yeah. society or all the corporations own all the intellectual property rights, you know, it doesn't work so well. So it becomes more nuance but generally speaking yeah. the determinism of you know the necessary conflict starts to to be very different you have mm. a role yeah. of the artifacts to change it and i actually think yeah. if we follow someone like Dietrich mcclowski or different things uh, one of the reasons capitalism and now you got to get into differences between modern capitalism and blah blah mm. i understand all that Absolutely. but generally yeah. speaking Austin. there was more of an yeah. emphasis on you know the, for whatever reason it's an elaborate conversation i try to go through in the, the creative concord about mm. marx you know the western nations had more of an explosion and adam smith talks about this in the wealth of creativity yeah. and it's really here's yeah. the funny thing what's so funny is that if you think about it and, and you know and and is and you were alluding to it what actually creates wealth for a nation is ideas, invention, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. pieces of paper. No matter how much yeah. um, wealth, you know, Louis the 14th mm. had or whoever, he couldn't get mm. a laptop. He couldn't get air, air yeah. conditioning. You couldn't get salt. They mm. went to war overseas, sure. right? People's yeah, quality yeah. of life is primarily increased by technological advancement. Now, of yes. course, we can get in more complex. I understand that. But generally, no, you, know, yeah. you know, technology. Well, wait a minute. If you take that seriously, 
the men mm. the 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 mental the creative the you know yeah. not the, <laughs> the 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 ont the ontological dimension of the human condition that is more complex yeah. and a high order than mere materiality then becomes mm. central to economic yeah. activity it becomes central to an economic activity so yeah. then what's so crazy is we've had a, a way of economic thinking that has made the opposite primary, that is really emphasized mm. on the material. You, you know, along, Daniel, y'all yeah. gotta be practical. Y'all reading all mm. this philosophy, go get a practical job. You know, then practical <laughs> is captured by the material when there's a failure yeah. to realize that it's the idea world that creates the artifacts yeah. that increase as well. So, so that's, you know, to, to, and then I'll pass, you know, that's all to say that yeah. the irony is that the age of pure, of pure explanation which is, you know, mm. practical or whatever, and supposed to yeah. increase the quality of, ironically ends up undermining itself by yeah. kind of deconstructing the very source of the actual yeah. increase of the quality of life for people. Yeah. Well, like one of, one of the ways we can see this is that like Paul Pot insisted that everybody became farmers <laughs> because there was no, like, <laughs> because there was no room for invention or creative ideas yeah. because the only thing that existed is what labor. Yes, that's right. One of the other ways we can see this is that with Marxism came a very, very staunch atheism. Right, right. Like it was built into it because what, what religion really is, is the belief in creation. It's yes. the belief of immaterial existence, right. which, go, which has problem of its own. Sure. Because, and we can, we can go back to the Gnostics and we can go back to problems of dualism. But, but, but and when you look at Adam Smith and when you look at, let's say, um, let's say the more libertarian version of uh, economy, their central tenet is that value is subjective. It doesn't exist in the material. Right. And that leads, in my understanding, to an, an openness to difference. Yes. So like when you speak to libertarians, they will say, well, I want gay people to protect their hash plants with guns. And you say, wait, hey, wait a minute. How does those three ideas go together? But it's necessary, but it's because you accept that there's a difference between the material world and the world of ideas that you also accept the difference between humans. Yes. You accept the difference between uh, like a, a proletariat and bourgeoisie. That's right. We don't really use those. Like we accept that Elon Musk is allowed to exist without being a fucking oppressor. Right. Like, okay. like, like but from a, from a Maxist perspective, he has to be an oppressor. Because sure. he doesn't work like work. What is value? Value is labor. Well, he he might work a hundred uh, hours a week and sleep under a table in his fucking office every day, but <laughs> but that should only be like a few hundred hundred euros more worth or dollars worth more, right? Right. So like, if we don't have the conception of the creation of value as something non-material, we will never be able to explain the world that is not non-material. But the other thing is true as well. That's right. If we don't have the we don't have the material, then we'll be stuck in in evaluations without without let's say uh, let's say premises that are grounded in science. That's right. So it's yeah. a com it's a combination between both. Where well, we can utilize science. So so like um, I've had some interesting discussions where like is it possible to scientifically cal calculate your way towards a perfect society? I would say no, because sure. the problem of evaluation is infinitely right. complex to to uh, to calculate from a materialistic point of view. You have to experience it, and the right. only way to make those calculations is through interactions through beings that acts like a, 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 a semi uh, uh, like idealist computer of its own right, which is in its entirely own matrix. But That's you right. can't extract that out to the to the physical. So, oh no, that, that that's excellent. And well, and you know, if, if this, for one, this alludes back to what you're saying about vector theory being practical. Because if you take seriously the idea that these multiple vectors, um, inter the material and the idea interacting is what gives you the economy, or at least a good economy, if you will. Yeah. Well, suddenly taking vectors seriously is how you, oh, I don't know, create wealth, actual wealth, product, you know, an increase yeah. in the quality yeah. of life of people. Ironically, yeah. You're, you got these people who are focusing on like raw materiality in the name of being practical and like getting down to earth, yeah. which is like deconstructing the very engine yeah. that increases the quality yeah. of life. It's like a good Kafka yeah. story or something because the only thing humans see. Okay, uh, but I would say, 
Yeah, just fin finish the Kafka. Well, I'm just saying humans are really good at irony. Like we're really good at yeah. irony. Like in the name yeah. of creating like a higher yeah. quality of life, we proceed to do the very thing that will undermine the increase of yeah. that quality of life, at least on a mass scale, yeah. you know, for people. But what were you saying along? Yeah. So what I was saying is that, okay, but then how do we have a single world where let's say the myth of creation from uh, the Bible is true, but Big Bang is also true, right? right? right. How can they be true at the same time? And in order to, we have to, we have to understand that there are more than one type of truth. Sure. Which also comes from understanding that there are more than one kind of existence. Yes, different so, values. Yes. So the, symb the symbolic truth isn't the same as the ma material truth. That's right. That's right. But both can be pragmatically useful. Well, we have to understand, <laughs> neither of them explains reality fully. So that was the problem of like the fundamentalism of idealism, ex ex excluding co calling people witches and burning people yes. who say, well, there's also a physical universe. And, oh, yeah. and luckily materialists haven't gone that far yet, <laughs> except for, except for, I mean, like, Different except people. for like killing like the Holocaust, for instance, which was not necessarily based on idealism. Sure. Uh, or it might, it might have been to some, 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 some extent, sure. but, 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 but there's like, we, we have a tendency to kill the other instead of embra embracing the difference. Well, the, you see, the, the problem becomes, um, you know, if we use that language of explain and address. So, you know, if the, if the creation myth addresses you in, in Genesis, but evolution explains you, you know, one level is addressing your subjectivity and your place in the universe, and the other is explaining your place in the universe and how you got here, if we just use that language distinction. Explanation, yeah. you know, address without explanation, if you're told that you're a result of um, God creating you, and then evolution comes along, it shatters your entire feeling of being addressed, right? You get into the Charles Taylor disenchanted age, you know, meaning yeah. being de deconstructed. So address without explanation is fragile. But explanation without address is meaningless. You were talking about matter yeah. earlier. What ends up happening is yeah. now in an age of pure explanation or more so explanation, mm -hmm. um, you get matter doesn't matter, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to make matter well, matter, then you need a dialectic yeah. between explanation and address. You have to understand you need both. Because right. the, the thing, I guess the way to put it, if we go back to yeah. that horizontal vertical and we're talking about the different vectors, every single yeah. vector has a nature or tendency to think yeah. that all of reality is encompassed with an yeah. explanation about itself. But yeah. you see what that ends up doing is blur the categories of explanation and address, yeah. and you end up not treating the full person or the full whatever, right? Yeah, the only it's, way it's basically, to- basically, uh, yeah, it's, it's like, it's ontological solipsism. From yeah, that's a, I really like that phrase. Ooh, that's really yeah. good, ontological solipsism. Because, yeah. you know, I meant to talk, I like to talk about um, monotheory and polytheism. Yeah. You know, how like mono yeah. uh, monotheism is a single like God and polytheism is multiple gods. So we also have this tendency yeah. to search for a single theory to understand all of the universe as opposed to multiple yeah. theories or different things. So likewise, I like what you're talking about because it's like the difference between... Uh, you know, um, mono ontology and poly, you know, poly yeah. ontologies, if we use that language. So what you're talking about, mm. so ontological solid, I'm going to put that on my sticky notes, because that's what we tend to do. And if we commit yeah. the fallacy of ontological solipsism, mm. then we, then mm. all we have is explanation relative, because all we yeah. have is that ontology address necessarily can only occur holistically. Oh, and that yeah. means it also has to be much more particular, personalized, yeah. and experienced. Like you only can address your mm -hmm. wife, for example, uh, by, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, knowing her and interacting mm -hmm. with her and explaining her. So the yeah. issue is we for too long thought we could address people in yeah. their personhood by merely explaining them. Now, again, if yeah. you don't explain them, that's, you're going to have a very fragile address but if you yeah. won't address them, it's going to be meaningless. So we end up, so so everyone then, fit, okay. then I guess you get into that meaning crisis that Pervake talks about, which I well, know. Let's, let, let me try to uh, understand like the, the sure. like address explanation difference, because like my, my intuition tells me that like uh, Christianity and other religions are also trying to explain something. Why that, like, I think like they're also trying to explain something about like the human condition. Sure, sure, sure. sure. No, they, but, but through, no, it's a very good question. And, and hopefully the paper, you, because there's something, so basically like you could say the Bible is 20% explanation and 80% address. This is where it gets difficult, where things can be okay. doing a little bit of both. Like my wife and I were gonna on Friday do like, an, like a conversation on explain and address. Because like, for example, if, um, you know, maybe if, um, if I go up to, if, um, you know, if I'm having a bad day, 
And um, she mm. looks at me and goes, well, Dan, you're having a bad day because you didn't drink your coffee. That's true, but I'm also having, because I'm addicted to coffee, but I'm also mm. having a bad day because my boss said something dumb that now I have to deal with at work. So, you know, you have one explanation yeah. that's part of it, but we haven't addressed the whole thing. That's an operation. Yeah. So there is absolutely an element of explanation to address, but you cannot yeah. reduce address to explanation. And it, it's an yeah. interaction sort of thing. It's like I, mean, I, 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 really, I really like the distinction, but I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say that each vector can be defined through either uh, fully. I would say the like, address would... has to be the whole. Like if I, if it's like the stack, like address is going to be very, yeah. very more holistic as opposed to like, the problem is, is to reduce yeah. per people to a single vector. And then they, then you've explained the rest of the complexity away. But let's say, let's say, at, let's say atom for instance, right? Sure. Then, then we are addressing something but 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 when we then go into the theory of how atoms exist together and form molecular bonds, then we are explaining. Yes. But like when we say when we say God, we are addressing. But when we when we read the book of Job, with all its insane fucking complexities of like, then then we are like maybe maybe not explaining anything. Maybe we're just making things more obtuse. But we are trying to give information. Okay, so the, the, the way I would uh, explain the difference between, let's say, science and religion is that good, a good religious story, just as any narrative, uh, really uh, changes like whenever you're reading it. So it becomes an interactive experience, more, more so than, than when you're like, reading a materialistic explanation, which, which hopefully should stay the same regardless of who you are as a person. Right because it, it describes like the, the matter of fact, but like when, when you are reading like uh, a religious story, um, it affects me differently, like uh, depending on what I did that day. Yes. So sometimes I might like um, read it as like uh, uh, referencing the archetypes. Other, t other times I might see like um, the marriage between the sun and the moon as masculine and feminine, but other times it's also about like, how gold needs silver, which was like sure. the alchemical, the alchemical science was like trying to combine them into a language, like all these different associations, where you saw like that the religious um, conceptions of uh, like uh, all all the gods also had like something to do with how matter interacted. Yes, 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 but, yes. But that's like um, so. So I would say that re religion really allows itself unless we are dealing with fundamental religion, which in my opinion, true, true fundamentalism doesn't really com com come into the picture before or after materialism. I agree. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because, because religion suddenly thinks that it has to compete with materialism as an explain as only being an explanation of yes. the world. It's and a very, very good question, problem. you know, because there is a mixing of explain and address yeah. in, in the Bible. The issue is, if you don't have the distinction between an explain and address, yeah. when you've been following Genesis as yeah. explanation and address your entire yeah. life, and then it turns out yeah. there's evolution, by not having a distinction in the language, you deconstruct all of Genesis. You go too far. Would you, deconstruct would you agree time. that, that we, we can define address as lending itself to interpretation? To the person, to where, the subject, yes. Yeah. To the person, that's right, so explanation. Where, more where, where explanation becomes yeah it becomes the so you can say like when you're reading the bible it addresses but it allows ourselves to explain yeah so when 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 but when you're reading a scientific paper it explains and allows yourself to address whatever you're applying yes. it to that's correct that's correct but, yeah that's okay. yeah you need to operate according to a dialectic because you see yeah. if if you think that explain equals address yeah. when it turns out yeah. that genesis is not true you get you throw it all out because you're, you're not able to say, okay, well, it turns out what I thought was an explanation was actually operating yeah. on the address level. So let me drop that yeah. and bring in yeah. the material, you know, yeah. more scientific understanding, but I'm not going to yeah. throw out the address part. What ends up happening no. when I'm, when I'm, when I, when I was talking about an age of quote unquote pure address or an age of pure explanation, yeah. what I mean by that oh, is, yeah. you know, in the age of pure address, it's where we treat, yeah. we treat address as explanation. Like that's all you need. Yeah. Once I give you address, oh, then you have explanation. Yeah. An age of pure explanation yeah. is where I say, once I explain you materially or I explain how you got here or whatever, yeah. well, then you're addressed. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, what we need yeah. is a meaningful distinction 
between the um the the explanation mm. and the address mm. and realize you have yeah. to dialectically deal with both yeah. of them but if you don't even yeah. have that meaningful distinction yeah. in your head well then you then yeah. either you end up throwing out all of science yeah. or you end up throwing out all of religion and i yeah. think that's yeah. very consequential because exactly what you're yeah. saying um there is something about the religious orientation that lends itself in the direction yeah. of the creative spirit that lends itself yeah. into the direction of seeing and pursuing that if you de-emphasize yeah. that too much as opposed yeah. to having existed dialectically well you lose the creative spirit and then there's something about human beings that once it loses that creative aspect hmm. that they suffer men mental health issues they suffer there's something oh, yeah. and yeah. existentially Absolutely. suffer so that's yeah. very that's very problematic yeah. um i think yeah. also what i really like you know um like when you're talking about the subject and how it's changing and there's interaction and it's always moving. You know, I was talking with Cadell, like, um, you know, in the absolute knowing talk on how, you know, we talk about the truth, uh, which human beings seek the truth, which would be pure explanation where you kind of Wittgenstein, you know, it's the world, you know, it's the world is everything that is the case. Whereas in Hegel, the absolute is everything that, that is the case plus you. But that means yeah. that means there's you changing the facts. And as the facts change, you're being changed yeah. by them. And you have this like feedback loop where it's always recreating yeah. and going to higher and higher and higher. Vector yeah. theory makes space for that. That, you know, vector yeah. theory is a theory of the absolute, not the quote unquote truth or the enlightenment or the yeah. parable or different things like that. Yeah. And, and so likewise, you know, a reason I like it is because it then becomes a, such a good conceptual framework for talking about yeah. why you need address and explanation and you need them interacting Absolutely. with yeah. one another. Um, and then, yeah. funny enough, um, I think there's very good reason from study of economics and going back to Marx and Arvik, where if you don't have that schema that's favoring the absolute, well, then you stop being creative and you stop, oh, actually advancing <laughs> you know you don't have as mm. much of a creative impulse in your society the funny thing is people yeah. say what are you talking about here's the fact people say what are you talking about daniel you know we have the this is an idea economy there's all the creatives and the new things and everything well one i agree with peter Thiel and tyler cone that it's actually the yeah. innovation is stuck in these particular sectors we're still using the same airplanes by the 70s but actually i would yeah. also argue that the very fact that we have in the public school tends to be against creativity, frankly. They say mm. they're for it, but they're not. And that's yeah. another conversation. Um, yeah. The very fact that you can have such a lack of emphasis on creativity and have a few ideas that then create tons of money goes to show you yeah. how powerful creativity is. And imagine, because mm. you could have so little that can do so much. And I know you get into monopolies and different things and that's fine. But mm. imagine if you had a society that had a meaningful distinction where you really, really did emphasize creativity as what increases mm. the quality of life, that that had a dialectic yeah. between the idealistic material, mm. it would have very powerful, practical impacts mm. uh, for, for yeah. everyday people. So I think vector theory is very practical, mm. just, just on yeah. what you were saying. Yeah, and I think it's uh, I think it's slowly happening just from like the, um, the technological paradigm shift uh, into like digital, because like like we 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 would never have met if it sure. wasn't for, uh, for for the internet, and like I was, I was very, I was not very well adjusted through the school system or for law school, uh, and and what began to make me more well adjusted was finding people that that were similar to myself uh, in, in the way that we, I, I don't necessarily accept like the mainstream explanation for things. And sometimes like to investigate a little, right? Oh, sure. So, but that's that's not necessarily. But like when you're living in in a, let's say a schizophrenic society, where 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 everybody is sort of expected to behave the same way, like expected to work from like uh, nine to four, and like and and expected to like go through like this schematic of what a life is supposed to be, and if you fall outside that. You are either crazy um, or, or like, uh, or, or sometimes you are successful, and then you are put like on a pedestal as a weird object to behold, right? Oh yeah, yeah. But but that there's also that has to do with us living in these mega societies where like individual identity never really gets to emerge. Um, so I think like these new internet tribes. Are creating like if you look at like our internet tribes, we are pretty much interacting with like these hundred and fifty six people, right? Oh sure, like pe people might have have thousands of thousands of followers, but but it's it's Fugazi, right? Like really, really, we are we are creating these new tribes, and what is happening now is that like whenever a new paradigm shift occurs, 
like human history is retreaded. Mm. So right now, like we are, we are seeing like the warlords of uh, of Facebook and Twitter, and 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 at some point, a middle age will will occur mm. where mm. these monopolies will break up, and we will find ourselves even more in decentralized uh, social spaces. Mm -hmm. it, at least it's my hope. Oh yeah, well, that, I, uh, well, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And well, one, it's important to realize that you know I think uh, Marshall McLuhan and Neil Postman, we talk about technology yeah. is always a Faustian bargain. Bar, um, Faustian bargain for oh, yes, yeah, sure. people can use the internet to be shallow, to be addicted yeah. to oh, Instagram absolutely. or whatever, but people can also use yeah, it yeah. to frankly get a better. I doubt that. Um, well, the internet makes possible a level of education that no one in human history has had access to, and I think that's a fair statement. Absolutely. Certainly not that the is. average person. And so that's pretty insane. I mean, I'm now able yeah. to, like when you had the TV, for example, and you didn't have laptops, you couldn't say carry yeah. the TV into your kitchen as you clean dishes because your children really enjoy dumping all their food under the booth table. Um, you know, yeah. you couldn't bring your TV and turn on a lecture. I can take my laptop and be listening to, uh, you know, the conversations, you know, uh, the, all these different people while I'm cleaning. You know, you can do the, there's yeah. these things you can do that you couldn't do in the past that is really important. And they certainly... Mm -hmm. Um, if you were someone who wanted to question things, uh, well, in the past, you basically were probably alone and you were made to feel crazy and you would probably give up and you would stop. But now you can find people that connect and bring in help refine yeah. your ideas and figure out and you yeah. can move. So there's a, you feel yeah. more addressed. There's a possibility. Well, of that's being also addressed. why like most, most philosophers went crazy, right? Yeah, they like, because oh, yeah. of, because of that total isolation, but like in the oh, yeah. tribe, you had like the shaman, you had the shaman, right? Mm. You had the guy who takes the uh, gods from the cat and starts to play it with a bow, right? You, okay. had those, you had those people and they were a valued part of the community. Oh, yes. So my, my hope is that, as you're saying, it's a Faustian bargain. Right now, we are seeing more censorship than maybe ever. Sure. Like, but, but in a weird way, it's very because weird. Like, people are trapped in these like confirmation loops, right? Where like earlier, like it was very obvious, like the, the newspaper you were reading, had a bias, didn't have a bias. Now it's like, like it's impossible to fucking navigate. And like both sides of the equation are becoming more and more polarized, polarized not need, not realizing that both perspectives are needed and that's right. That's you right. need somebody to care for the internal structure and you need somebody to look at the horizon. Oh yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. like the insanity of Republicans and Democrats battling each other, like a civil war is about to begin not realizing that they, they fucking need each other. Well, I you mean, know, it, you know, if we go back to some of the sociologists, which, you know, I try to cover in belonging yeah. again, you have this understanding, and obviously Freud understood it, Philip Grief, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, people need a dialectic, a, you know, between givens and releases. You know, they have like stable yeah. things and freedom, yeah. right? Like if you yeah. have too much structure or too much givens yeah. or so on and so forth, you're oppressed. But then if you have yeah. too much freedom, you don't know what to do with yourself and you're existentially overwhelmed. Oh, yeah. So one of the great yeah. problems is generally speaking, conservatives overemphasize structure while liber liberals yeah. overemphasize freedom. And as a result, um, both of them become neurotic because you do become yeah. neurotic if you get too much freedom. Again, we talked about, you know, different things. Yeah. Um, you know, a bird needs both a left and a right wing to fly, right? You get one, the bird yeah. just kind of goes in the circle and digs its face in the ground and it, you know, cuts itself yeah. up or something and it's quite bad. Um, the thing also like what you're mentioning with the internet, I think um, increasingly it's going to be the case um, that if you want, well, for me, the, the very difficulty of knowing what's censored and what's true really does put the emphasis on reading the great, you know, the old books, the ones that have stood mm. the test of time to really investigate. Yeah. I think it also forces, I think for me, it becomes a heuristic where you focus on more philosophical ideas because philosophical yeah. ideas, you can't really censor philosophical, you're thinking through, right? But if I'm talking sure. about like ideas that are based on an authority, like what the government yeah. says or what the econ, well, yeah. I'm, I'm in, I have to trust the authority, right? And I have to trust yeah. the news story that comes out. And I'm not saying you can't yeah, do any but of let it. But let me qualify that a bit because like we believe that there is a news story, but it's like the, the news people are receiving are so different that like, that there's like the whole Kyle Rittenhouse case right now, sure, right? Sure, sure, sure. So there's a, there's a bunch of media outlets painting it as though like he never raised the gun. Right. And there's a bunch of media outlets painting as well, it was pure self-defense and so on. Right. We don't really like we don't really know what the fucking truth is, but but what when I say censorship, what I mean is that 
your confirmation bias is so extreme right now that it's not even an active choice anymore. Yes. Like yes. You, you are kept away from other perspectives by the algorithm, right? The algorithm yes. which can work wonders and become the greatest tool for, for, for human uh, sure. evolution is right now being used to, to polarize us, like, oh. it, like insanely so. Well, people, uh, people don't realize, you know, they go about tasks of, say, um, learning about something or wanting to be up to date on the news story or trying to see the COVID number, whatever it is. Yeah. And they don't realize that as they're doing that, they're literally building yeah. their prison cell. Like they are the, <laughs> the very acts of looking these things up is putting the bricks down, you know, layering it, putting yeah. the bars and then they're trapped and they don't even know they're trapped because yeah. unfortunately the prison cell seems to be made of like glass almost where you can see through it. Yeah. So it gives you the impression that it's not there, but it's very much there. What's that? I guess yeah. the not why that Russian novel before Brave New World where everything was made of glass yeah. and different things. That was a really yeah. good book. Uh, but, uh, yeah. but, but so, so you, you don't realize now, and I think that's a very important point where the censorship is a self-censorship. It's like yeah, you exactly. yourself are constructing the very censorship that is censoring yeah. you. And then what's crazy yeah. about that is that means the acts you participate in to fight that censorship are likely absorbed mm -hmm. by the censorship yeah. and makes you, yeah, because exactly. here's the problem. Yeah. What the, the censorship is now designed in such a way to convince you that you're a critical thinker. That's the best kind yeah. of censorship. Like <laughs> censorship, you know, censorship that makes you realize you're not yeah. a critical thinker doesn't work. Yeah. You know, a prison no, exactly. cell you can yeah. see is one you'll try yeah. to get out of, but a prison cell you yeah. can't see is one you won't yeah. try to get out of. It's kind of like the difference since we live on a farm, you know, we have animals. So it's kind of like the difference between a prison cell and a field. You know, a field mm. has fences, you have free range, but you're not actually free. You just have enough mm. range so the cow doesn't get upset yeah. and want to escape. But if we make yeah. the lot too small, like if on the farm, if the lot or the field yeah. is too small, the cow gets crazy and tries to leap over the fence. So you have to find, yeah. if you want to contain the animal, you find yeah. enough space where the animal mm. is happy. It feels like it can roam, that it has like control, but actually yeah. it's stuck within those fences. So what's happening is the algorithms mm. are working in such a way that is giving people people free range so they feel like yeah. they're free but they're only free yeah. within a range that mm. functions in service of confirmation bias but that's mm. why that's why it's so bad because like when you directly yeah. put people in prison cells or you like burn books well you could yeah. visually see the burns booking right yeah. now Absolutely. what they do now what they do is train you to have an emotional reaction when you see certain yeah. books that you just happen yeah. to never get around to reading them yeah. but they Absolutely. also make you but they also make you feel like that you'll eventually get around to reading those books because yeah. you're or a you critical understand them already, right? you know yeah. I'll, I'll get there i'm gonna you know yeah, yeah, I know what he's going to say. Yeah, yeah that's right. Everyone yeah. is about to read the infrastructure bill. Oh, yeah, I'm going to read yeah. that tomorrow and yeah. tell you what I think about it. Everyone's yeah. about to. You're always yeah. about to. And that has a critical yeah. function of convincing you that you're a good participant yeah. in democracy and critical thinker. And yeah. the algorithms are always creating that feeling of mm. free range. And to me, yeah. if you if you understand that. The practical implications of that is you do indeed start to focus on the creative element, like what you can do, yeah. because, you know, as opposed to just consuming, because whatever you consume mm -hmm. is just going to contribute to the free range if it's not consumed for creation, almost in a shelling yeah. kind of way. And, it goes, you know, Nassim Tlaib, I think, in Anti-Fragile, he has that part where he talks mm -hmm. about, you know, we tend to assume that if someone is old, that they're going to die mm. before someone that is young. You know, with people, you mm. use the model that age equals bad. But he says when it yeah. comes to books, though, or trees, you know, yeah. and you would be better to bet that an old tree is going to be here 20 years from now versus a young yeah. tree because the old tree has been Absolutely. there. Longer. Likewise, mm. old books are older ideas like Hegel or whatever. Mm. So, the, you know, the very fact that Hegel has been around for so long, it's probably really mm. good evidence that he's going to be around for another 200 years yeah. as opposed Absolutely. to whatever's on the New York Times or whatever just came out yeah. in the new philosophy journal or whatever. And I'm not saying yeah. that stuff is bad. But you start going, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, well, that's true. Right? You start going, okay, the high majority of the yeah. information I'm receiving from the news or that's being filtered to me by yeah. the internet is probably contributing to my capture and free range. Well, that being yeah. the case, I probably should focus on the things that have stood the test of time because there's a really good chance that mm. that is going to actually be productive. 
that I'm not just going yeah. to be contributing to the construction of my glass made prison cell, um, you know, or my, yeah. my free range. But of course you have to find a balance because you don't want to be ignorant about what's going on in say Chinese American yeah. relations and Taiwan and semiconductors and the uh, you know, supply chain crisis going on in uh, mm. California or something like that. You don't want to be ignorant about mm. it, but you also, I think it trains you to, you treat ideas with different weight, you know, different ideas mm. with a different kind of open handedness. Like Hegel, I feel pretty confident to like clutch and say, yeah, I'll stand with Hegel. Mm. But mm. the um, the new story that I get about something going on in Wyoming, I'm going to hold more like this, like an open yeah. hand. I'm like, I'm not attached yeah, exactly. to it. Yeah. It's like, it may be true. It, I don't know. And I'm also mm. not invested in it. But like philosophers, mm. I'll get invested in, you know, I'll, I'll clutch them yeah. a little more. I'll hold them tighter, maybe yeah. not clutch, but hold them tighter. So I think taking seriously what you're saying about the algorithms transforms, you start to, the, you learn the skill of holding knowledge differently or holding different yeah. ideas in different ways, which you don't really get in college. You know, you don't really get in school. It's like a skill of knowing what ideas to hold yeah. and, and to relate to them differently. Well, I think a part of the problem is also that if you live in a universe and you believe that it to be materialistic, you also believe that their the opposition is wrong, factually wrong. Yes, yes. So, so like, um, like accepting that differences of opinions can both have truth in them. There's also a like ontological uh, presupposition under that, where you accept that well, there's also something that exists that isn't ma matter of fact, That's that right. isn't material, that is value based, that yes. is experience based. And my experience is not the same as your experience, is not the same as anybody's experience. So I believe that like when you see these, like, and what, what I'm like, what I'm seeing is that, well, the difference between let's say masculine and feminine, which, which I see as left and right as well, has already always existed and always been necess necessary. But right now we have the, almost the pathological version of each has become the norm. Yes. Because they are so disconnected. Yes. So, so like what I'm, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that eventually like digital will work its way out of this. But like what we are seeing now is like some, somebody like on, on one side, some people are claiming that the world is going to end in 12 years because of climate crisis. And on the other hand, some people are claiming that it's all a Chinese hoax. <laughs> right? Right. So, like, and, and well, it's, it's very hard to see how they, those perspectives can both be true. Well, you know, oh yeah. Well, there's a really great sociologist. His name is uh, Dr. James Hunter. And he wrote a book he, in the, I think 91 or the nineties. And it was called Before the Shooting Begins. And he was talking about America on the issue of abortion. And he wasn't really getting into what side is right. What he was talking about is the way the issue of abortion affected democratic exchange and how people talked about yeah. it to one another and how they kind of went together. And what he was warning which is quite fascinating is he ends the book sort of saying, hey, if we don't figure out how to um, have democratic exchange, and he calls it yeah. substantive democracy, where we can talk about not just yeah. opinions, but first principles, like very mm. like metaphysical frameworks in a way that doesn't lead us to conclude we need to kill one another, then the United yeah. States of America is going to be, end up like, you know, the Balkans, or yeah, you know, yeah. it's going to be torn apart. And he said, you don't think that can happen, but, but it can. One of the, one of the yeah. reasons I really like vector theory is because vector theory absolutely um, contributes to a pluralistic democracy that is substantive, not just shallow. Yeah. You know, because there's a difference yeah. between substantive democracy and just sort of shallow differences. One of the problems with yeah. intersectionality is what does the word intersection mean? It kind of cuts, splits, yeah. it like creates division. Yeah. Like intersectionality, unfortunately, places different. This is what's so weird is there's a very big well, it's emphasis. Also, um, yeah. Oh, sorry, continue. No, no, I, and there's a big emphasis of difference in intersectionality, but it's almost yeah. not deep enough. It's not ontological enough. It doesn't go to this deep no, level. Exactly. It, yeah. It's very shallow. And so it doesn't create a real dialectic. It just creates separation yeah. on a horizontal level. Well, but that's, that's also like intersectionality is based on the only difference can be po power based. Like it's, it's right. um, so yes. You, and like and power is based on like physical, physical characteristics mainly, right? right? Like it's uh, like it's and and there are like and even that as insane and extreme as it sounds, there are elements of truth in it. Of course, but absolutely. With vector theory, we understand that well. The truth of intersectionality exists in the intersocial domain, 
but it doesn't it doesn't go into the biological domain it doesn't go into the domain of consciousness so even though like even though i am belonging to an intersocially defined group i also have subjective evaluations yes which like so so like intersectionality becomes a reduction to that so i think like the whole thing is that like accepting that that perspective must be inherently limited as well, because otherwise it becomes this like extremely polemic uh, yes. uh, structure. Yeah. Well, it's like a lot of times what will happen, and I tried to uh, get into this on like deconstructing common life on the difference between like Derrida yeah. and human different things. Like very often intersectionality yeah. is defined in terms of, um, you know, race, sex, and gender, and basically what yeah. are defined as the sources of power. When I would argue that if you get a white guy who works in a blue collar job versus a white guy that gets <laughs> a white collar job, they are way different than two people who are in the same kind of work who are different genders yeah. or sex or different. Like, like the, the funny thing that ends up happening sometimes in intersectionality is the whole gambit of what makes humans different is actually left out to emphasize the ones yeah. that are associated with power structures. And so the, so the diversity is not deep enough, even as it simultaneously yeah. praises diversity, which of course, if it's not going to have deep diversity, it has to convince itself it cares about the diversity because otherwise it would catch itself and have to change in the same way that the person who doesn't critically think must think they critically think and thus have enough yeah. of a ventilation system in their ideology to just, you yeah. know, it's like the person who's a hard liberal, they'll listen to Trump, yeah. for example, just long enough to convince themselves that they listen to the other side and just happen yeah. to, and then turn it off. Because if you never li listen to Republicans, you'd have to mm. tell yourself that you're, you know, in a tribe, you know, that you're closed off. So everyone has mm. these ways of letting letting in the other side just enough so they, they can yeah. convince themselves they're a critical thinker. Likewise, intersectionality lets in yeah. enough diversity so it can tell itself that it's caring about real diversity without getting super yeah. substantive on those really, really deep mm. levels. And again, mm. I, you know, I really like the vector theory, and I know I keep saying that because I just want to compliment you on it. Because again, once you start thinking in terms of vectors, like social vector, you know, the, 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 the material vector, the vector that religion is yeah. doing, it just gives you a language that helps you move and understand yeah. what you're doing. It really helps you know, people talk about mental models, Charles Munger and all that, yeah. moving between the mental models. They yeah. don't really have like mental models for ontologies almost. Like every vector, yeah. it's almost like every vector then comes with a different set of mental models. And you say, okay, mental yeah. model set A is over here unless I'm in vector B. Mm. Okay, I'm entering into vector B. So now I'll bring in this set of mental models or then you move yeah. up to a different vector and you know, you just have an yeah. organizing principle for what you're doing. And I like vectors because I, again, if I'm trying to be charitable mm. to Deleuze, Deleuze, yeah. when he essentializes difference, I feel like he's really getting there. But unfortunately, by not taking it to the vector language, I actually mm. think it ends up contributing to um, intersectionality and could actually become, yeah, of agree. course. Yeah. I, I don't think it has yeah. to, but we have to. I don't think Deleuze no, no, has no. to. I, I, I feel like no, there's a way to salvage him. Um, but I also I like this. This mark, But I also think there's a way to salvage intersectionality. Mm. But I think the way to salvage it is to not include... Uh, uh, the address and the explanation within with, within the same banner. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. But, absolutely. So, yeah. So it's like we have to. Okay. So sex exists. Uh, race exists. Like these things do exist, but they are not the sum total of all. And that's the problem with with intersectionality, is that the address the, the address and the explanation becomes one. That's correct. Instead of saying, hey, what what are we actually addressing? Well, we are addressing a part of reality that exists, That's but right. it can be the sum, some total of reality. And on the other hand, so so I I like I, I have like a disgust reaction when I read intersectionality. So I have to force myself. Yeah, you have to force yourself, right? I have to force myself to like accept. Well, there's also there's also a truth in it. Yes, it it is addressing something and it is explaining something, but there's also like. It's not explaining anything. It's not ex addressing anything. E everything. Well, so when I you think, go to, I think that's the. Um, oh, oh, I think yeah. the key is that uh, yeah, the key, the key is that not throwing anything out, but like allowing things to co coexist. Well, but right there, if you take vector seriously, or you take the yeah. di the difference between explain and address, or if you really take seriously that there's truth located in the opposite, you know, mm -hmm. per se, yeah. then you force exactly. yourself. Here's what the emotional experience of not liking something yeah. then becomes something yeah. you push into. Because yeah. the only way to get truth is to push into yeah. it. But here's the horror. Yeah. If you don't have all the yeah. language that we're describing, the feeling yeah. of disgust 
actually becomes yeah. evidence that you shouldn't push into it. Yeah. The meaning of the feeling of disgust, if we use that language, transforms yeah. relative to, if you think in terms of vector, substantive pluralism, yeah. that, you know, all these different things, what becomes evidence yeah. of reason to push, to look away, suddenly turns yeah. into evidence to push deeper. And, when, and, and so that's a big deal because, because here's the problem, feelings yeah. do not tell you what they mean. Yeah. You know, it's like, you yeah. know, Car Cardinal Newman had that word. It was always funny. He would say, yeah. you know, he's like, you know, actually words don't tell you what they mean. They feel yeah, like they no, tell yeah. you what you mean, but you have to decide what they yeah. mean. Likewise, yeah. emotions don't tell you what, what they mean. They yeah. feel like they do, but they actually don't. And if you don't have the right yeah. ontological framework or the right understanding yeah. of the world, then you actually don't have the right way to understand how you should respond to emotions. Yeah. And that actually will feed the uh, the polarization and all the, the different troubles. I mean, when you yeah. mention intersectionality, I mean, you know, I you know, thinkers like uh, Charles W. Mills and Blackness Visible, Francis yeah. Fanon and white, you know, white, you know, white mask, black skin, you know, the existentialism of intersectionality has a lot of truth to it. Like when you get to the existential yeah. dimension, it's the it's the Foucaultian, I guess we'll all associate with Foucault and there might be Foucault scholars that don't like this, that's fine. But when you get into that realm of power, where it's all talking hmm. about power as the underlying mono theory yeah. by which to so understand that's reality. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's when you get yeah, a problem. It becomes the, yeah, yeah, and it becomes like, absolute yeah, so yeah, what, yeah. what we also have to understand that like having a disgust reaction is caring about something. Well, that's the other thing. Like you right? don't, you don't, you don't, yeah. And this is like from like if I don't, if I'm not butchering Heidegger, but like a, a, like a big part of the way we understand being and, and truth of being. It's like caring about it. Yes. So like I I I hate intersectionalism, but I also care enough about it to hate it because there's a part of it that must be true, true in existence. Absolutely. In the same way, they hate um, uh, logos. Yes. They hate the idea that the world is based on certain structures that uh, and biological structures, which means that there also are a difference between sexes. Uh, to some extent, right? Sure. They hate that because they they know it also exists, yes. but they want to they want to replace it with the absolutism. They want to change the world by reducing it into their own pathology. Sure. So sure. basically, basically, what we are doing in vector theory is like a, an ontological uh, 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 psychic analysis or psychoanalysis, right? We're trying to cure ontology from from the pathology of, of like uh, reduction yeah yeah just like just like a, a deceased person uh, might reduce everything to sex or might reduce everything to like some core trauma ontology is precisely the same way but it's made up it exists in the realm of ideals and it is similar to psyche in the same way that all the archetypes are expressed through the different ideologies and ideo uh, ontologies, ideologies, epistemologies. Yes. In some sense, it's all like a giant fucking, uh, like a super organism psyche, which we are now trying to take to the fucking doctor <laughs> and, and, and make these different parts of it play nice again. Well, the, you know, if we go to like Judith Butler, for example, and you get the distinction between yeah. sex and gender, right? Where you talk about like yeah. the social construct of what the woman is supposed to do versus the biological yeah. reality. What yeah. vector theory would say is that there's no hierarchy, that they exist dialectically mm. together and you have to understand both. But again, going back to our homo hierogotis' nature, we want, yeah. conservatives want to make biological, um, I think it's yeah. sex, biological sex, be primary, where gender, there's no yeah. social uh, pressures or anything like that. Where the liberal will want to make gender, which is the social construct, more real than anything else. So you can do a similar move on yeah. um, race and orientation Absolutely. and, and yeah. different things like that. The, the name of the game is the, the dialectic, is actually having them operate together. I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, we can read the new Jim Crow South by uh, Michelle Alexander, and we can read Point of West, different things. There has been banks have done redlining. There have been Jim Crow mm -hmm. South. There have been targeting fraud. There is certainly, I think, that Harvard report showed that if you're, you know, an African-American that the police pull over is more likely to be roughed up. So there surely are mm -hmm. social realities that have Absolutely. real impacts on different people. But the, but the, Everyone is at danger, you know, um, everyone is in danger of falling into a quote unquote conspiracy. And what I mean by that yeah. is you can have like the, Q, you know, QAnon is a good, you know, an obvious example yeah. of a conspiratorial structure, yeah. but basically Foucault yeah. can be a kind of conspiracy yeah. where there's a certain yeah, the like, same like um, 
institutional racism where you're seeing like the the fundament of all Western institutions are racism. Yes. That's like that's a pathological belief system in the same way that QAnon is pathological. Well, right? it ha it has the thing is conspiracy. The key to a conspiracy is that is yeah. in, it is internally consistent. There is no there's a kernel, yeah. There is no yeah. obvious mistake within what it accepts is true. The problem is yeah. what it accepts is true may not be true, right? But based on well, the it's also 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 poetic, right? Like it's yeah. creating its own truth. Yes. So, like the thing about QAnon, right? I I, I saw the documentary Into the Storm on HBO. Oh, Super I need to see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's it's good. It's, it's good? good. Yeah, I need to see that. <laughs> it's it's really funny because like it ends up like there, there's like um there's like a trickster character who's behind it all, like behind the whole QAnon. Like Q or but whatever. what it does right. is that yeah, Q, it creates its own categories of truth. Yes. So like. If if it if if something like if Q is saying something and something happens and there's even the slightest similarity that proves it. Yes. If nothing happens, that also proves it. Yes. So it's the same like like um, and and in like when you're talking about institutional racism, like you just call it internalized racism or internalized yes. misogyny, right? So you are creating an autopoetic like self-manifesting system which is inter it, it, like internally consistent. But what makes it a problem is that it's not able to relate to any other victors. Yeah, it, that's the key. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. It can't like, and that's the way to identify a cancer. Like yeah. a cancer is something that will not die, will not die, and will not interact with the all other systems. Well, so again, that's like a, a cancer of the mind. Oh, absolutely. Well, all yeah. all fundamentalism. Tends, tends into conspiracy. It, the, it tends yeah. to an into what I call an internally consistent system, which is what a yeah. conspiracy can be. One Again, another reason why vector theory is so useful is because it gives you a test mm. to determine that, yeah. okay, the internally consistent yeah. system operates on this plane of existence, yeah. but it doesn't yeah. operate on any other. Yeah. So for example, yeah. like with Trump, you know, a lot of conservatives basically, um, nothing that Trump did was bad. He yeah. couldn't do anything yeah. wrong. And they yeah. had a logic um, that yeah. made it thus. And nothing, and yeah. so they always had a way to filter out anything that went against yeah. Trump, right? And Trump was, yeah. you know, and the election was stolen, right? Any evidence that shows it was not, <laughs> there was an explanation for it. Because that gets into the definition, you, you know, I talk about it all the time, where what you believe is true determines what you believe is rational. The problem mm -hmm. is what is true, what you think is true may not actually be true, but it will still yeah. orientate your rationality. Well, that's kind of terrifying. Because if rationality yeah. comes after truth, how do you determine what your truth yeah. should be to organize your rationality? Yeah. Oh shoot, there's a there's a there's yeah. a problem here. But but that all yeah. operates on a horizontal. If you if yeah. you introduce a vertical, say by different vectors, you now have an, a test that can go in that direction yeah. on having to operate yeah. so on different say, planes. I would say that the test is can it coexist with the completely opposite perspective? Yes. Yes. Um, like, can it exist? Can it exist in a world where the opposite might be true? And yes. I would say that's a, like that's a that's a test for all. Should be a test for all systems. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, yeah. it, you know, it's A equals B, right? If A can equal B, following yeah. Hegel or whatever, then it doesn't quite work. Well, and the thing is, wherever there's fundamentalism, which almost by definition there must be, if there isn't vectors. Yes. Almost by definition, there has to be a materialist fundamentalism, an idealism fundamental, whatever. There has to be some sort of fundamentalism where there isn't vectors. Hmm. All fundamentalism lends itself in the direction of conspiracy, which is to lend yeah. itself in the direction of cult. So what ends yeah. up happening is your uh, the, the implications of not having a vector theory yeah. uh, on the sociopolitical level is that everyone ends up in yeah. cults, which are very yeah. similar yeah, to exactly, tribes, yeah, exactly. but they're not yeah. tribes. <laughs> you know, they look like tribes. I should also, I should probably also say that there's a really large difference here between relativism and perspectivism. Yes. So it's not because it's not because like every like everything is true. Yes. But it's like it's because truth is defined from what truth category like is is sense is is part of the sense making right. of of what you what it exists within. So the, it's just to clarify that it's not. Oh sure, 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 it's not sure, 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 sure. No, well, the the, the thing is like the the the. the if I think it's going to rain today, right, yeah. then it is rational to bring an umbrella. And let's say it doesn't yeah. rain. Does that mean yeah. I was irrational? 
No, I was rational to what I believed yeah, was true. Sure. The very fact yeah. that there were multiple possibilities, yeah. say it could have rained, it may not have rained, maybe it hailed yeah. instead of rain, does not mean relativism yeah. is true. It means that there is a conditionality. Uh, yeah, that's basically Mises, right? Like, like uh, rationality is acting towards a purposeful goal. Yes. So that, like, I, I, that makes perfect sense. Then you have, like, I had a really interesting discussion with uh, Jan Viavake, mm. who was arguing for, like, um, uh, uh, like at, at every so, uh, I thought to this version of like rationality where it was only like the good, true, and beautiful. And I kept saying, <laughs> I kept saying, well, there is a there is a subjective uh, uh, value based uh, rationality which exists in a different vector. Right. So, like, I was trying to explain that I didn't get very far, <laughs> but, uh, oh, but yeah. that's that's also the thing. Like rationality, um, like this this shit test for for a system should be like, how does it interact with other systems? That's right, that's right. Yeah. Well, thinking in terms of vector, again, going back to what we said, introduces a yeah. vertical dimension of which yeah. then things have to be tested, the horizontals can be tested yeah. on. So every internally yeah. consistent, you have to, you have to live in an internally consistent system, right? I mean, otherwise yeah. you wouldn't have, you couldn't function. That would almost get into, uh, I guess, CS purse, yeah. fixed belief. You know, yeah. you have to have a sense of a fixed belief or else you go nuts, yeah. right? Or different things. Yeah. The, the question then becomes, how do you keep your sense of fixed belief or givens and et cetera and so forth from turning into a freaking cold or a conspiracy, right? Well, yeah, you ha question. they have to be somehow opened but mm. still feel closed enough so you can function. Well, if we introduce vectors, yeah. we can be closed horizontally so we can get that yeah. it scratch there while open mm. vertically. So then you yeah. get an open. So you're, you're not so yeah. crazy that you can't function, yeah. but you're also not no. so closed yeah. that then you're yeah. joining QAnon or something of that yeah. nature. Yeah, exactly. And I think like one, like it's, it's, it's maybe, it might be a pipe dream to, to expect people to be open, but what I, would, what I would suggest maybe instead is aware of lack, awareness yes. of lack. So even just being aware that like my fixed set of beliefs doesn't describe the sum total, I, I believe that would be enough. Sure. I would, to, to at least facilitate communication. Because like the problem right now is that like uh, both, like the, we're not able to communicate anymore if we have a disagreement because we believe that one of us must be right from a materialist point of view. Right, right. <laughs> well, it, it's like if you lack, exactly right, lack has sociopolitical consequences because if yeah. you say, if lack is an essential dimension of life, if you can never fully yeah. escape it, then even yeah. when you say, okay, I have an internally consistent system by which to, or framework by which to understand mm -hmm. reality, well, it still yeah. must be lacking something. So you yeah. always have, instead of, you know, I was talking about, so you always have a bit of an open hand. You know, you're not dropping it like a relativist where you don't believe in anything, yeah. but you're also always open to new information because lack has a yeah. kind, it has an openness to it where you're always open yeah. to something new. But if instead of, well, that, and that also will give you an ontology that emphasizes becoming as opposed to being, you know, if you oh, have yeah, a being, sure. you know, I have internally consistent, boom, I don't need anything else. And in fact, here's the thing, yeah. um, new information becomes a threat. Like if the goal yeah. is being and stability and, and all that different stuff, well, once you get it, man, you don't want to introduce new yeah. ideas. You don't want to, pluralism, no, no. <laughs> pluralism must be bad. Yeah. You know, it has to no, be. But it's also, um, but it's also because there's like, I think there's also an acceptance of death in accepting lack. Yes. So like, so like in, in some sense, you have to accept that your system is not eternal and it's not the sum total of all. Yes, and in that in that also like so it's so interesting like when you see a person like Christopher, uh, I always call Richard Dawkins talking about there is no God, and somehow like in that fundamental perspective, like he is trying to avoid the death of his own system. Like yes. what he's doing is actually clinging on to life even more, like just as much as religious people, okay. because he's avoid he's avoiding the death of his own identity. Oh yeah. So like, uh, and this is like what permeating systems are all about. It's oh, like, yeah. well, like the dance of Shiva, like the creator is also the destructor. Like, and it must exist in an ebb and flow of destruction and creation because otherwise it turns into like these absolute cancers. Well, and you know, and, and then that, you know, Mr. Ebert's on that death avoidance, how that preempts cancers. I really like that idea. And exactly, yeah, yeah, it becomes I, cancerous. I think I borrowed the term from yeah. You know, what ends up happening is, you, so use Richard Dawkins. So 
Richard Dawkins achieves, um, gets to a point in his life where he achieves a worldview that feels um, stable enough. It becomes like a fixed belief, yeah. you know, to use yeah. that purse line. And I know it's spelled Pierce, C.S. Pierce, but I think he always said purse. That's what I heard. I always thought that was interesting. C.S. Purse. Yeah, um, know. yeah, it's weird. I don't know. Uh, us Americans, we can't even pronounce words. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but so he gets to a state of stability, a fixed belief. Where here's what ends up happening. It 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 gives him enough of a balance between explain yeah. and address for him that it that it yeah. works. It has a practical address. But here's the problem with that. This yeah. is why fixed belief is so um, problematic, even though necessary. Well, bring in bring in vector theory. You're threatening that equilibrium of explain address mm. that he has found yeah. in his own life. So then it's terrifying. Yeah. You're going to kill that. Yeah. And then and then yeah. how much work will he have to do? It's like, um, you know, Wittgenstein mm. had that line where he said that repairing a tradition is like repairing a spider web with your bare hands. And I always thought yeah. that was a tremendous line. Well, the amount of work that goes into getting you back to an equilibrium between address and explanation, once you get it, which often you get mm. it by shutting out difference and not listening to the other side seriously. Yeah. That's how you get it. So it's a fake or false or shallow equilibrium. Yeah. Well, once that's ruined, the amount of work you might have mm. to do or to investigate could feel mm. like repairing a spider web with your bare hand. So you get neurotic. You get pathological. Yeah. You're going you're gonna to fight anyone who would dare mm. introduce something that would threaten your equilibrium. Um, because mm. you're 80 years old or whatever, you know, you're oh, you found you, yeah. you found your Sabbath, which <laughs> equals like yeah. rest, but not working, but like sleeping or whatever. And, and now yeah. you're just you're just going to get the status. Because here's the other well, thing. Well, in some in some sense, it's even worse than death, because mm. like it's also it's also the like disappearance of the life you had, the meaning in the life yes. you had. Yes. It's yes. like oblivion. Like it's like I think it's like facing oblivion. Because like everything that you thought about your life, everything that gave your existence meaning, is now like uh, dissipating. Oh. It like it's it's like ego death of, of ontology, right? Oh, it's very good. So the loss, it you know, um, a lot of times people resist Richard Dawkins because you know it's he threatens the enchantment of religion, as yeah. Charles Taylor talks about. Right? Well, actually, Dawkins no, is you know yeah. Dawkins is right. operating. He didn't want his enchantment lost. He's got his equilibrium yeah. between you know address yeah. and explanation, and you're threatening that, and then boom, yeah. life life changes. And it's not the like I, I grew up like a super like I live in Denmark where mm. nobody is fucking religious. Right. So I grew up like a really really like militant annoying atheist um and there was nobody there was nobody to discuss with because everybody was just yeah man we we, right. we know <laughs> we agree yeah. and i like and i love christopher hitchens and i love like all the uh writers of the apocalypse or whatever they're called yeah four horsemen and then like i yeah four horsemen yeah and then like i i started reading like young and like and his perspective on this and it was also combined with me like having like death anxiety and like I I, I I I was thinking so much about what um, what consciousness what was mm. that I lit like I made myself sick <laughs> like really 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 sick like it was like like just That's jolting amazing. with anxiety attacks yeah for like years and, and it was like I went to like a psychologist what the fuck is wrong with me it was like it's like you just need to read some philosophy man like there's nothing like you're not insane but like, oh, I, don't, I don't have any answers for you <laughs> like i can give you some pills and no i don't want any pills you just take so, this like, aristotle I'm, okay read one chapter a night <laughs> you know it's like yeah but the interesting thing was that opening myself up to i felt like i was standing in front of a fucking abyss sure because like the categories i used to the, to understand my reality suddenly ceased to fucking make sense because right. there was like this soul, like I was experiencing there was a soul, but I couldn't uh, explain that through materialism. So right. I felt like I was going fucking insane. Right. And this is where, this is where like the whole, like I, back then I called it for negative dialectics as well. Mm. So that was like, and, and which then turned into um, emergence theory and vector theory. But like the thing I discovered was, the scary thing is 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 staying the, the, like what saves you is going into the abyss. Yes, like that's where that's and this is also an interesting enough. Like you find your father in the belly of the whale. Like you see this like these images in stories and like and and religion, right. and they all keep telling you, go go into the fucking oblivion. Right. 
because like avoiding it is what creates pathology yes creates the sick mind so going into it really like becoming it and like Ebert said Ebert had like a beautiful quote uh, I, don't, I, I think it was in a private chat where he said um, the only way to get out of sadness is to become sadness go deeper into it yeah yeah go deeper go deeper into it oh yeah so this is the same like the, the solution for Richard Dawkins is, is going into the oblivion. Well, and, um, the, you know, the key is if we, you know, go on that socio um, governmental political level, you know, that OSHA idea of going into sadness, you go deeper, whatever. Basically, in my opinion, if you do not have something like vector theory become the um, ontology of the average person yeah. by which they organize rationality, pluralism's doomed. I mean, pluralism yeah. will just ultimately become a return to fundamentalism somehow, or you'll just get Absolutely. World War III. Uh, if you, no, like, yeah. if we don't, pluralism right now is still in the realm, in my opinion, of the shallow. It's, you know, it's like, just mm. like James Hunter warned. Um, but in order to make it go to the realm of the deep, you've got to have an, onto, you got to have a metaphysical change. you got to have that ontological, mm. but it's not going to be enough just to guilt people into it, you know, and say, well, you, yeah. you know, you ought to listen to people that disagree mm -hmm. with you and love them and different things like that. Yeah. Well, okay, well, we're just going to figure out a way to make it look like we do without actually doing it. Like yeah. to actually have deep substantive democracy, yeah. you have to have a metaphysical framework that truly values the difference, that truly yeah. values the different dimensions of human beings. Oh, and, we're, and if indeed human beings entail this mixture of vectors, you know, this mixture of these mm -hmm. different on ontologies, we're never going to feel addressed until we take it seriously. Mm. So you got two crises. Yeah. You got a mental health crisis that's going to get worse mm. and you have yeah. a um, tribalism, you know, tribalism becomes a, a bad term, you know, a tribalistic, yeah. fundamentalist, tribalistic, fundamentalist crisis yeah. that's going to develop. Those two are both stemming from a very similar source and that's a lack mm. of a metaphysical vector theory, like a new metaphysical yeah. framework. Those are yeah. both logical, they logically mm. emerge out of simply yeah. having a single um ontology by which to understand how the world yeah. operates and so it's not, neither of those yeah. will get better and the great thing is that i haven't actually met that much opposition to it great like when i'm when i'm talking with people about it like different philosophy professors and like thinkers from different different fields like i'm not really seeing like any disgust reactions that's great at all so so and they might come but they might uh, but maybe, maybe not. I mean, I'm optimistic. Uh, it, I, I would, I, I would be really, I would be really interested to to find somebody who had a discussion reaction uh, uh, to vector theory and why, and find out how to include that in vector theory. Yeah, we're good. Just kind of second, second up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or different things. Do you do you find people <laughs> like who are big on I don't know, like unified theories, quantum mechanics, bringing general relativity together? Do people like that? have a hard reaction against vector theory or or is it the case that since because we were talking about it and I, you know it doesn't seem like it seems like that can feel, you uh, can move that aside almost i almost want to say the yeah, I, what i i like the, the people who, who i've talked to who had like a unified theory have almost felt like there was like a release of tension when i told them about vector theory oh, that's good but oh holy shit it doesn't all have to be contained within one system like there is a relaxation like um that has been my experience so far but um that's great yeah uh, well that's why i like it i mean once you yeah. separate the vectors and you have different ontology like then unified theory like if you're in the business of figuring out how quantum mechanics and general relativity go together so on and so on and so on yeah. you know you can just kind of focus on that you know, you don't have to like yeah. build it back up to why your you well, and your mom don't get along. I mean, I think like what would really benefit quantum mechanics right now is a proper theory of subphysics. Hmm. So, so hmm. in some sense, I think like quantum mechanics is, is stuck right now because it's it's trying to explain potential states from a materialistic. It's it's trying to explain potential from a state of actual like actual occurrences. So yeah, you can't you can't fucking do that. I well, mean, I, I've uh, really enjoyed reading and listening to you talk about that because I feel like that's such a, yeah. a really, really good direction uh, and is, and is yeah. very, very fruitful. Um, and I again, mean, it's, it's probably a topic for all part of I'm, 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 I'm getting a I understand. You know, I like to keep well, people uh, for about two hours and 30 minutes. Um, I want everyone yeah. to know that you also do, you know, wonderful uh, play screenwriting on Young and different things. Yeah. And I didn't even, I got so excited talking about vector theory. Uh, I'll, I'd love to speak to you again about those things. And Let's I will that. say, yeah. yeah, this has been a ton 
ton of fun. Uh, I've really so enjoyed much it. Fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you for yeah. the work you're doing. I think vector theory matters. Yeah. I think it can help people. Yeah. I think it is very practical. Um, and it also yeah. addresses mental health, you know, the political. It has so many different yeah. um, ramifications. So I appreciate it so much. So thank you so much, Elon. This has been a Thank delight. you so much for having me. Uh, and let's, let's do a part two. I, yes. I, think, like, I feel like there are a lot more topics to cover. Uh, yes. So let's do that. Okay. Absolutely. Let's do it. Thank you so have much, Alon. You have a great day. We'll do it again. I really, really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, sir. Me too. Bye. Appreciate it. Bye.